In this world, fairies are slaves, second-class citizens, and servants to humanity. Picture yourself as a young girl with the occupation of a sugar artisan, because also in this world, confectionery sculptures are the most valued artworks to exist. You must travel to the capital of the kingdom to compete with your art for a royal medal, because winning would honor your mother and raise your reputation. But the road ahead is dangerous, filled with bandits and rabid animals, so you must purchase a fairy servant who is a capable bodyguard. However, you weren't expecting to come across such a beautiful and powerful fairy, one that makes your heart flutter. Except there's one problem. He hates humans, you included. So, will you be able to win the medal and melt his frozen heart? This is the exciting story of Sugar Apple Fairy Tale. Let's get started and watch this tale unfold. In a tale from long ago, the Highland Kingdom was once the land of the fairies. The fairies loved peace. They loved beautiful and fun things. And so they lived quietly and peacefully for hundreds of years. A young Anne Halfort felt bad for the fairies as her mother told this tale. Her mother went on while crafting her confectionery, saying 500 years ago, humans rose in rebellion and made the fairies their servants. People say that fairies were fools who idled away their time and lost to the humans. But the mother personally didn't feel that way. There are fewer fairies than humans, so she believes they were simply outnumbered was all. Little Anne asked her mother why she thought that, and her mother told her to just look at her creation, and Anne marveled at the beautiful sugary depiction of a fairy. Tasting some of the sugar, Anne also loved the delicious flavor. Then her mother explained that sugar confections are a sacred food. They extend the lifespans of fairies and bring good fortune to humans, and the first ones to make these sugar confections were fairies. The method of refining sugar apples into silver sugar was discovered by fairies as well. That's how sugar confections were invented in this world. Anne's mother explained this is precisely the reason why sugar artisans, most especially silver sugar masters, must never look down on fairies. They must keep company with fairies as friends. These words rang true throughout Anne's childhood. And now, at the age of 15, Anne brought a bouquet of flowers to honor her deceased mother. She wanted her mother in heaven to look after her, because Anne vowed to become a silver sugar master just like she was. As Anne hopped on her carriage, her childhood friend Jonas Anders caught up to her, saying she was awful for leaving without saying a word, but she knew if she had said goodbye, he'd probably try to stop her. However, she admits being grateful to him, his family, and this village's people for being truly good to her mother. But this year, she intends on entering the sugar confectionery exhibition, no matter what. He understands as he's a sugar artisan too, but he believes it'll be impossible for her to travel all the way to the town it's held in, Lewiston, alone. After all, she's small for being 15, and as scrawny as a scarecrow, and her entire fortune consists of this rundown cart and horse. But he loves her as she is and asks her to marry him. Brother, that is not how you court a lady. Apparently, he's been entranced by Anne ever since her and her mother first came to their village. With him bragging that he came from a wealthy house and related by blood to the founder of the Radcliffe Workshop School, Anne used this opportunity to take off and gave her goodbyes. She believed Jonas would never seriously propose to her. She thinks he just pities her because she's lost her mother. And she also doesn't like the idea of marrying someone and living as their wife. She wants to live her own life. She wants to chase her dreams. Arriving at her first town, she spotted a crowd and commotion going on. And oh no, this man was crushing a little fairy. The older man next to her explained that this labor fairy who serves the fairy hunter stomping him stole his own wing and tried to escape. With a grimacing look, the man presented the fairy's wing and squeezed it, throttling the little fairy under immense pain. With Anne knowing a fairy's wing is its life, she's horrified asking why no one is trying to save him. The little fairy being gripped in the man's hand told him he'd never loyally serve a human. He swore to take back his wing no matter what. And with the man threatening his life, Anne kicked him from behind the knee, catching both the fairy and his wing. The little fairy grabbed his wing and scurried away, saying he'd never thank the likes of a human. Anne understood, after all, she is one of those detestable humans, isn't she? The fairy hunter then got up to yell at her, because she let his labor fairy escape. 
She then scolded him saying that if he was going to kill the fairy, her letting him leave is no different. The man then began raising his hand towards her, but the crowd didn't take violence towards the child so kindly, which forced him to take off. Anne then went to the fairy market and witnessed the horrible sight of the enslaved fairies being made to be sold as companions. She herself, though, was looking for a warrior fairy, but most of the stall owners wouldn't keep fairies as dangerous as that. But, apparently, there is one stall here that does. Entering the stall, Anne glances at a large, beautiful fairy wing and the charming looks of this human-sized warrior fairy. She felt that the word beautiful could never do this fairy justice. She'd never seen a fairy like him. The fairy tells her he thought he saw something familiar, but it was nothing more than a scarecrow, referring to Anne, but she doesn't like that at all. In this world, she's considered a girl in her prime. However, this fairy doesn't care about the prime of a scarecrow. The stall owner then appears and apologizes on behalf of his merchandise. This fairy apparently calls anyone who passes by names with no care for who they are. This isn't good enough for Anne though. She believes with a sharp tongue like that, he'd never sell as a companion fairy. However, the stall owner corrects her because he is in fact a warrior fairy and killed three fairy hunters that tried to capture him. That's just how powerful he is. Anne is shocked, remarking that the warrior fairies she's seen up until now have been burlier and bigger. The stall owner assures her of the quality of his merchandise. He doesn't have any other fairies because warrior fairies are difficult to handle. The fairy then tells Scarecrow to stop dithering by him, which shocks her further that he's commanding her to purchase him. The store owner laughed, finding it interesting as this is the first time he's heard the fairy ask for someone to buy him. He questions if the fairy fell in love with Anne at first sight. The fairy then responded, Don't assume that I am like you, filthy human. So the man retaliated by clutching the fairy's wing, causing him to writhe in pain. Anne tried to stop the man, but he said the only way he was going to stop was for the price of a hundred crests. With the fairy shuddering on the ground, Anne felt no choice and paid the man, pulling the beautiful wing out of the baggie. Anne verified its authenticity. Taking her leave, the man warned her that warrior fairies are savages. If she lets her guard down, the fairy would most likely steal it away from her and kill her. The fairy then added he'd come to kill the stall owner as well, but Anne didn't like the fairy speaking as if he assumed he'd already kill her. As the two head out on her carriage towards Lewiston, she tells the fairy she wants his protection on the way there. He finds it to be a simple task. He'll even throw in a kiss as a special service. She responds by saying she doesn't need that kind of thing, and blushes knowing that would actually be her first kiss. She then asks for his name, so he snidely responds to call him Tom or Sam, whatever human name she likes. With her replying she'll call him Crow as a way to get him back for calling her Scarecrow, he calmly tells her his name is Shao Fen Shao. Hearing this, Anne remarks the name to be beautiful. She asks which part is his first name and which part is his surname, but we learn fairies don't differentiate between first and last names like humans do. She found the name to be a little too long, so she decided to call him Shao. Anne then thought back to the little fairy who suffered from his wing being squeezed. Wings are the source of a fairy's life force. Even if they're ripped off, they can survive, but if their wings are damaged, they weaken and die. Having learned that, humans rip off a single wing to force fairies to obey them. Anne stops the carriage to tell Shao she bought him because she wanted him to serve as her guard, but she promises once they arrive in Lewiston, she'll return his wing to him. Shao is surprised to hear she'd free a fairy that she just bought, wondering if such a naive human could exist. But to Anne, she's always believed that humans and fairies can be friends. That's all. She doesn't want anyone to serve her, and she also doesn't want to sell him to another human. That's why she'll return his wing to him, and on their travels, she'd like to even treat him as a friend. However, Xiao responded that they could never become friends. This is when Anne opens up that it was both her mother's and her ideal for humans and fairies to treat each other as equals. Xiao then replied that both mother and daughter have the brains of a scarecrow, making Anne raise her hand furious at her mother being insulted. But she stops herself, asking why, if he hated her so much, did he tell her to buy him? Xiao got up to look at her face to face and told her humans are all the same. In any case, he thinks serving a fool makes things easier for him. And seeing the beautiful gleam in his eyes, Xiao tells her she seems like the greatest fool thus far. Anne says nothing to this, only commanding the carriage forward. They make it to the bloody highway, a long stretch between here and Lewiston, where there isn't a single village or town. 
only fort shelters, which are convenient strongholds. There could also be wild animals along the way that attack indiscriminately, and bandits. Anna's surprised to hear shao has been here before, but he of course has been serving humans longer than she's been alive. Spending their first night at a fort shelter, Anne hands Shao his dinner for the night. Sitting next to him, she can't help but think he's quite vexing, but also that his fairy wing is beautiful. Even in the dark, she feels compelled to touch it, but as it furiously vibrates, he says, Don't touch me. Anne apologizes, realizing it was thoughtless of her. She wonders why she did that. She then screams in tears, calling out to her mother. Her mother appears, asking what's wrong, only to hear Anne had a horrible dream, a dream where her mother had died. Her mother then touched her face and told her to find her life's path and walk it resolutely. And as Anne's mom faded away, she told Anne not to cry, but Anne didn't want her to go. Anne then woke up in tears. With Xiao on top of her? She quickly jolted up, a little discombobulated, trying to process what was happening. He then smirks, remarking he almost had it. She felt Xiao was heartless, because all she wanted was to be his friend. He then stood against her, with her back against the wall. Friends, when you hold my life in your hands, I have been bought by you, forced to serve you. We can never be friends. Anne realized her behavior was foolish. She had already bought Xiao to serve her, yet she kept saying selfish things about wanting to be friends. She swears to never let her guard down again by rolling up into a blanket to protect the wing baggy, which makes Xiao compare her to a bagworm moth. Anne is embarrassed, but despite all of this, she intends to keep her promise once they reach Lewiston and return his wing. Once she does that, she'll ask him if he wants to be friends again, and tell then she's strictly his master. With Xiao staring at the moon, he felt maybe he should be more patient. He spent nearly 70 years being forced to serve humans. His freedom may have been put off for a day, but three days from now, he'll be free. Looking at Anne, he wonders why the sweet scent of silver sugar comes off of her, just like his precious Liz from before. The next day, they head out under the muggy weather, looking to reach the next port shelter within the day. Xiao then suddenly tells Anne to stop the carriage. Oh no, a carriage is getting attacked by bandits. They spot Anne's, so she asks Xiao to take care of them, but that's not enough for Xiao. With her being his master, he wants her to command him. Even with her face flush red, he tells her to give him an order. She finally tells him if he doesn't go, she'll punch him. So he jumps out of the carriage and prepares for combat, leaving a bloody trail of bodies with a single slash. He then dispatches one after another, and the remaining bandits leave after learning he's a warrior fairy. However, Anne could only stare in shock, having witnessed Xiao's brutal slaughter. And outside the carriage that was surrounded by the bandits earlier is actually Jonas. Riding forward, Anne asks him what he's doing here. So he tells her he was so worried, he came after her and from now on, he'd protect her. However, Anne pleads for him to turn back, knowing the coming journey is going to be too dangerous for him. But he just refuses, professing it's because of his love for her, grabbing her arms, saying it's for her sake, even though she doesn't really believe it. Xiao then pulls Anne's carriage forward to tell her they must leave quickly because the crows have caught the scent of the blood from earlier, meaning wolves will follow next. So she hops back to him and they move ahead trying to leave Jonas behind. But this doesn't work, so Anne has to unfortunately burden Xiao with protecting Jonas as well. At the next fort shelter, Anne once again tries to tell Jonas to head back. However, he still refuses, telling her he's simply going where he wants to go. His pushiness is really giving her a headache. After preparing some stew, she heads to his carriage to give him some, and his labor fairy, Kathy, answers the door, with Anne offering the stew for him to eat after he wakes up. Kathy refuses to take it, claiming such a crude meal would not befit her master. But Anne shoves it for the fairy to take and storms off annoyed, because here on the road, they all need to eat what they can get. Offering the stew to Xiao, Still seething from Kathy's insults, he wonders why her head seems like it's been set on fire. Xiao takes the soup from her though, admitting he was just surprised to see she served him before she served herself. She didn't think much of it since it was proper manners, but oh, she forgot a spoon. But when she came back, she was just as surprised to see Xiao absorbing the meal. Fairies don't eat with their mouths. They cannot taste food except for one kind, silver sugar. It's sweet. Hearing this, Anne blushes, wondering if he'd like a confection. 
To which he smoothly answers, I don't hate them. So, she proudly proclaims she'll make something she can enjoy. Given her mother was a silver sugar master, so she herself had been perfecting the art of making confectionaries since she was a toddler. She heads to her carriage, but is surprised by a sudden rumble inside. So she runs back to Xiao and begs him to check it out. However, he tells her it's not in order. Then he refuses. So she toughens up and heads in herself. With a stick ready, she stands in a nervous silence and gets jump scared by a little fairy, which she somehow whacks all the way into Xiao. It's the fairy Anne saved earlier, Mithril Rid Pod. He explains the rumbling came about because he had nodded off with a nightmare and woke up with a jump. Aside from being a stowaway, he'd come to return the favor she did him. This confuses her a little because she's pretty sure he said he'd never thank a human. But that's right. That's why instead he'll be returning the favor. Anne doesn't quite need anything done, so she suggests he oil her wagon's axles, which makes him feel insulted if that would be her request for saving his life. He wants her to give him a more impressive task. Xiao begins getting annoyed, so he asks Anne if he can strangle Mithril. However, there wouldn't be any point to her saving him if he did. She tries telling him she doesn't need any favors so he can be off, but Mithril tells her if she doesn't give him a task, he will follow her into the depths of the underworld. This whole interaction is making Anne exhausted, so she rolls up her blanket for the night, saying she'll make a confection for Xiao tomorrow. The next day, Anne is exhausted from Mithril talking all night, while he is napping peacefully. In the evening, at the next fort shelter, Anne introduces Xiao and Mithril to Jonas and Kathy, but her fairies respond pretty rudely, which embarrasses her. Seeing that Jonas has so much delicious food, she supposes he wouldn't want any of her soup, to which Kathy retorts, of course her master wouldn't eat such a crude soup reeking of beast fat. This irritates Jonas, so he tells Kathy to stop being rude and orders her to disappear. He apologizes on his fairy's behalf and quickly switches his harsh attitude towards his fairy to a kind softness, saying he'd love to have her soup again tonight. Anne nervously acknowledges him, even thinking the master and servant dynamic he has with his fairy is probably correct, but she doesn't feel good about it at all. Completely unaware of the tension Anne feels, Mithril stupidly proclaims Kathy's powers to be cool, but still lacking compared to his own. The next day, Anne asks what his powers are, and Mithril proudly explains he was born in a great lake in the kingdom of Highland, on a drop of water that landed on a leaf. Anne then asks if all fairies are born from water droplets, but that's not it at all actually. They're born from all sorts of things. They're born when the energy of an object condenses, when seen by a living being, doesn't matter if it's human or animal. Being gazed upon causes the energy to take form. That's what turns into a fairy. Since Mithril comes from a lake, he can control water. So, he conjures up a water ball and shoots the cold droplet at Anne. She's amazed and asks what else he can do. But when she learns that's pretty much it, he feels pretty insulted. Even Xiao snidely remarks, at most, Mithril could give some water to birds. But the fun mood comes to an end when a swarm of crows appear above them. Xiao explains that crows are typically scavengers looking for carrion, but when there is no carrion for them to eat, they form large flocks to hunt down prey and devour them alive. Hearing this, Anne commands Xiao to deal with the crows, so he tells them all to hide in the carriage. While the carriage rattles, Xiao slices crow after crow. After the ordeal ends, Anne sees him standing amongst the black plumage of the decimated birds. He walks towards her, cockily remarking she was so scared. Her legs gave out. She denies this and falls over. So when he catches her, he calmly asks, What's wrong, Scarecrow? Are you requesting a more special sort of service? She blushes, saying, of course not. And being let down, she thanks him, still flushed. Riding onwards, they're off schedule because of the crow attack. So Anne points to a doctor's inn where they can stay for the night on her map. She's getting upset at herself knowing her mother would have probably made it to Lewiston with much more ease, prompting Xiao to ask where her mother is. Anne sadly replies her mother died, and two weeks ago, she had made up her mind to become a silver sugar master, just like her mother. At the end of autumn, there's an event held in Lewiston called the Sugar Confectionery Exhibition, where Anne plans to submit a piece and have the king acknowledge her skills. She wants to be a silver sugar master this year, because in the winter, they celebrate what's called Pool Sol Day, 
where they send off those who died that year as they're pulled to the heavens. As a silver sugar master, she wants to make a splendid sugar confection with her own hands and send her mother's spirit to the heavens. She hopes to reassure her dead mother. Hearing her heavy reason, Xiao takes in Anne's heart of doing things. Reaching the doctor's inn, the owner gives them some rooms for Anne and her companions. Outside the dining hall, the gang spots two guests that arrived before they did. With Anne and Jonas sitting down to eat, she wonders why Xiao isn't joining them. But Jonas gets frantic explaining that fairies eating in front of people is usually considered both rude and absurd. She then asks the owner if it's okay and he's also nervous. Not because of himself, but in case his other guests have a problem. However, the man with the brown hair, Hugh, says to pay him no mind, adding it's perfectly fine. After learning Anne and Jonas are both sugar artisans, he remarks having two labor fairies plus one companion fairy, referring to Shao, seems a little excessive. Anne corrects him though, because Shao is a warrior fairy, not a companion one. However, he doesn't buy this, especially given Shao's extravagant looks. He questions if Anne brought him along because she's fallen for him, but she denies this. Hugh then has his associate, Salem, put Shao to the test, and the two end up clashing blades. Anne is furious, but Hugh just smugly apologizes, saying he just had to make sure because he didn't believe such a pretty warrior fairy existed. She's still mad though, until Hugh promises to pay for the stay of their entire group, on the condition that both she and Jonas make sugar confections for him. Gathering materials inside her carriage, Jonas asks if it's really okay for her to use her silver sugar, since she still needs some for her exhibition piece in Lewiston. However, she assures him it's fine. She just can't use what's in her other three barrels. Coming out, Jonas swears he'll become the silver sugar Viscount and asks Anne to marry him. But, of course, she still turns him down. Back inside, with Hugh having prepped all the equipment for the two to use, Anne questions his identity. But the man just tells her to keep quiet and make something for him. With the two pieces finished, Hugh applauded their proficiency. However, he crushes their pieces with his fists calling them so unsightly he couldn't bear to look at them any longer. For Jonas, Hugh comments that he's skilled, but all he wants to do is show off his technique, so his work completely lacks any inspiration. For Anne, Hugh thinks she did better than Jonas. However, the work seemed as if it were an imitation of something someone else made. He critiqued she was just copying someone else's style. All beauty, but no charm. With skills like these, he believes the two could never be silver sugar masters. Taking a little snack from the broken pieces as he leaves, Anne clutches her dress in frustration. She then runs off into her room, curled up in the blanket, irritated further because Xiao finds this all so amusing. He simply responds that humans never spend their whole lives being laughed at, because unlike fairies, humans are always changing. In another three years, he believes she'll become startlingly beautiful. The color of her hair will turn a pale, beautiful gold and her skills at making sugar confections will improve as well. Anne swears she'll improve her works to blow Hugh's mind, but feels some things can't change even with hard work. That's why she doesn't want to hear lies from Xiao. However, Xiao says he isn't lying. He knows firsthand because the very first thing he had seen when he was born was a human child, one who had the same hair color as Anne's, at five years old. He was born from that child's gaze, Liz. Her name was Elizabeth. She was the daughter of nobles, and because of certain circumstances, she lived away from society. She was young, knew nothing of the world, and didn't know the existence of fairies. That's why she mistook him as her older brother. She led Xiao back to her mansion and gave him shelter. Fifteen years passed, and Liz's hair turned a pale gold. Her freckles disappeared, and she became a beautiful young woman. That's why he knows. Anne will continue to change, just as Liz did. Anne then asked where she was, and why she wasn't here with him, which made Xiao clench his fist as he answered, She died. She was killed. Humans killed her. Anne tried to console Xiao, but he quickly got up and wished her a somber good night. The next day, as they continued their journey, Jonas called out to Anne, but she wouldn't respond. She was fixated on Xiao's past, especially on how he used to have an emotional bond with a human girl. Knowing he spent the same time with Liz as Anne had spent with her mother, Xiao also must have had a familial relationship with that girl. So hearing it was stolen by human hands really saddened her. Humans caused Xiao's heart to freeze over. In the fort shelter, Anne was curled up because of the cold. 
Shao then explained that fairies don't feel weather like humans do, seeing him by the fire, and desperately wished for a magic that could melt Shao's heart. She decided to prepare the sugar confection she promised him, but opening one of her barrels, she found it completely empty. She was distraught, wondering where her silver sugar had gone. Shao came in to see her crying from the situation at hand. She has three barrels left, but the silver sugar she needed to make her entry piece is gone. Sitting down at the fire, Shao explains the situation to Jonas, who is flabbergasted. He wonders how that was even possible knowing Anne's cargo hold was locked. But Kathy then mentions she saw Mithril coming out of the carriage window the night they stayed at the doctor's inn. His body sparkled in the moonlight, meaning he was most likely covered in silver sugar. Mithril then suddenly woke up, hearing all of the commotion, and Jonas suddenly yelled at him to come down to them. He then accused Mithril of stealing Anne's silver sugar and that Kathy witnessed it. However, Mithril denied the accusation. Mithril pleaded with Anne, hoping she wasn't suspicious of him, but with her shaken look, even though she didn't say it, he could tell she was suspicious of him. This brought Mithril to tears and he stormed off. Even though Anne didn't want him to go, Anne was heartbroken, ready to give up, but Jonas suggested she just make enough silver sugar for her entry piece. Anne doesn't believe that's possible, since she doesn't have any sugar apples. However, Jonas knows there's a grove of sugar apple trees near the bloody highway. After picking the apples, the two work together to refine the silver sugar she needs for the next three days. Handing Shal a sample, he questions if Mithril was really the one who stole the silver sugar. However, none of that mattered to Anne. She just needed to spend her time crafting her entry piece. She stared at the sketches her mother had drawn for specific confection designs. But Hugh's words of her works just being imitations rang in her head. She was still unsure of what to make for the competition. Later, Jonas comes into her carriage and applauds her work in progress. But his motives are a little too much as he pulls her in, looking to steal a kiss. But she quickly slaps him away. She straight up tells him that she doesn't love him, which is pretty fair. He then turns around saying he'd hoped she'd fall in love with him, but he just apologizes and leaves. Later that night, Kathy has a word of advice for Anne. Even though Jonas says that he loves her, Kathy doesn't want his words to go to Anne's head. She gets pouty saying her master would never fall for someone like her, but then quickly blushes with Anne figuring out she's actually in love with Jonas. Anne then cheers her on, believing love between a human and fairy is lovely, but this just makes Kathy dip out. This love makes Anne wonder what Shao's actual relationship with Liz was and why her chest suddenly began feeling so tight. But Anne herself denied any feelings. She knows Shao is only with her because she has his wing. And this will all end when they reach Lewiston. Wiping her forehead, Anne finished her hard work. She still had second thoughts remembering how Hugh crushed her previous work, but she assured herself that this was fine. She had to let the piece dry, so she decided to look at the scenery until Shao joined her. He felt it was strange, since when he had first met her at the fairy market, she always smelled of the sweetness of silver sugar. But he never understood why, until now, knowing the scent had always come from her hands. Then Jonas suddenly came out to congratulate her on finishing her piece. He then ran over to her wagon, and getting on, she spots some wolves chasing her horse. Jonas then says if she had just married him, he wouldn't have had to resort to something like this. And oh man, on that horse is Kathy spilling scraps to lure in the wolves, and she throws it all over Anne as well. As Jonas takes off with Anne's cart, Anne and Shao find themselves surrounded. Anne begins begging him to go after her entry piece, but he refuses knowing she'd die if he did, and he protects her while slaying the wolves. After defeating all the wolves, Anne sits depressed, wondering why Shao didn't go after Jonas. She already knew the answer, but even so, she didn't want to let him have the sugar confection. She cried, claiming Shao only protected her so his wing wouldn't get damaged. But Shao had no words for her pain. Eventually, it rained, so she took shelter in the wagon Jonas left behind. Inside, she saw her mother's confectionery designs and wondered why Jonas had them, to which Shao answered Jonas likely had intended to enter the exhibition all along. So first, he stole her designs but was unable to recreate the steps. That's why he instead contrived to steal Anne's work and head to Lewiston. Anne then opened a barrel and found her stolen sugar. Kathy must have been the one who stole it, since she has the power to turn invisible. 
Then Jonas estimated the amount of silver sugar she used to make her piece, and loaded it into Anne's cart in advance, and stole her wagon with the finished piece inside. Anne wondered how Xiao could know this, and he simply answered, that's how humans are. Anne then came up to Xiao to hand him his wing back. The exhibition is the day after tomorrow, and Jonas will have already reached Lewiston. It's too late to try to get her piece back. He then asked if she was satisfied with this, and reasonably, she shouted, of course she's not. But there's nothing she can do, even with him here. So she's going to set him free, and he can go elsewhere. Xiao accepted it and took off. So now, Anne was all alone. Sitting in front of the falling rain, she apologized to her mother for failing to send her spirit to the heavens. She cried, asking why her mother left her all alone. The next day, Anne woke up to bright sunshine, her gaze fixed on post-rain blueberries with one in particular beginning to glow. With a fairy appearing, Anne reached out, admiring how pretty she was. The fairy happily greeted Anne, the human who allowed her to be born. And then suddenly Shao appeared to speak on this phenomenon. The little fairy, Lucelle Almin, greeted Shao, knowing he was just like her. But he simply told her to go where she likes, and to never approach humans, because they capture their kind, steal their freedom, and force them into servitude. Lucelle was confused because Anne was also human, but Xiao explained she's different. With that warning, Lucelle thanked him and took off happily. Anne then gave Xiao a serious expression, making him wonder what's wrong. She's unsure why he's still here, so he tells her she hasn't kept her promise to him yet. She promised to make him a sugar confection. So, wiping her tears, She's going to do it, because she promised, after all. After cleaning herself up, she begins crafting her work, all for Shao, who came back to her. Lifting the sheet covering the piece, Shao is surprised to find Anne created a model after Lucelle. Anne knows it's a bit small, but she assures him it's her truest sugar confection. The word he has for it is beautiful. He then holds it up to stare at it against the sunset, and Anne asks to touch his wing, to which he agrees. When she holds it, she runs her fingers across, feeling how warm it is. After pulling away, he asks her once again if this sugar confection belongs to him. She agrees, so he'll do as he pleases with it. With the carriage ready, he suddenly carries her inside because they're leaving for Lewiston. They're going to travel through the night to arrive by morning. Definitely flustered, she wonders why Shao is doing this for her, to which he answers, since she gave him back his wing, she's no longer his master. So. This is their chance to actually become friends. Anne's eyes widen, asking if that's really what he wants. And of course, he's got a coolly answer. I don't know. While shrugging. At the sugar confectionery exhibition, Jonas stands nervously with Anne's stolen piece. They then announce the arrival of King Edmund II. And after he and his wife take their seats, they notice the commotion of a carriage running through the crowd. But Shao stops it right before the guards. Anne runs in ready to enter as well, but the guards stop her, until Viscount Hugh Mercury gives her permission. Anne is surprised to discover his true identity as the head of the Mercury Workshop School and the kingdom's current Silver Sugar Viscount. With her taking her place, Jonas makes some snide remarks, and man, do I hate this guy. He has the nerve to insult her piece for being small when he couldn't even make his own. This guy is trash, but with Xiao watching, Anne is determined to win. Viscount Mercury then called to unveil, so all the competitors displayed their works before the king. King Edmund made the call to have both Jonas and Anne bring their works before him. The king had a strange feeling about the works, and asked the Viscount for his opinion. Viscount Mercury commented that it seemed like the two pieces had been made by the same artisan, given how alike they are, which caused Jonas to shudder in fear. The king preferred the small piece Anne presented, thinking its beauty could shatter in an instant. Ephemeral, yet so full of life. He claimed to have never seen a work so beautiful. His wife, however, felt the sugar confection for a display as a centerpiece at the festival needed to be large and spectacular. This makes sense to King Edmund, so he announces Jonas Anders as the winner. And man, this guy has the nerve to scoff at Anne. However, the next important step was to verify the authenticity of the sugar Jonas refined. And inside the barrels, they only find Mithril passed out from eating all of the sugar. Mithril suddenly woke up, begging the king for forgiveness, claiming he was just a lowly labor fairy serving Jonas, and that Jonas is so bad at making silver sugar, 
He couldn't craft the required amount. Jonas screamed that this was a conspiracy and grabbed Anne, explaining that Mithril was her servant and blamed her for making Mithril consume all the sugar. Anne then got out of his grip to speak the truth that Jonas had stolen her piece. The two begin fighting, so Viscount Mercury has a way for them to prove themselves. He's going to have them both attempt to replicate one of the wings on the winning piece. Anne is certainly confident, but scumbag Jonas isn't so certain. Midway through their work though, the Viscount stops them, as it's obvious Jonas's wings are a terrible disgrace. Seeing Anne's though, he does feel they resemble the winning pieces, and even King Edmund thinks the winner should obviously be Anne. But with a closer look, the two realize the wings Anne made are still different from the winning piece. So the king ends this year's competition with no winner. Anne tries to address the Viscount, but he tells her there's no need for formalities and to simply call him Hugh. She wondered why they determined the winning piece wasn't made by her, and Hugh explained improving her technique actually worked against her. The butterfly she made just now wasn't anything she copied from anywhere else. It was clearly 100% original. Anne then began tearing up, thinking of her mother as she was praised for her own original style. The queen then told her attendant to tell Anne that she hopes she competes again next year as she's looking forward to her work. Hugh is left in charge of Jonas's punishment, so he asks Anne what it should be. Anne walks over to him, commanding Jonas to stand up and she smacks the shit out of him. Oh yeah, she feels better and I do too. And now he's bruised and ridiculed in front of everyone. Sifting through the crowd, she finds Xiao to tell him she's going to enter again next year and to give him the confection she promised. Only for him to turn around and say it looks unpalatable because he wants something made by a silver sugar master. She already told him she'd become one next year and that's when he told her he'd finally taste her work. So until she becomes a silver sugar master, he'll stay with her. He then pulls her close to give her a light kiss on the hand. And of course, Mithril has to ruin the moment. Anne apologizes for thinking that even for a second that he had eaten her silver sugar. He accepted it, and it didn't really bother him much because he had actually been sleeping inside her cart ever since the little scuffle. And with a peaceful end to the day, they ride off to their next destination. Just like I wish you'd ride along with me by liking this video and subscribing to my channel. Here on my Shoujo Weekly, I've got plenty of fun stories for you with action, romance, and pretty faces. So come on, you gotta subscribe, that way we can vibe. Trying all the different shops in Lewiston, Anne wanted to go to one more. However, she was surprised that the famous confectionery shop of Alf Hingley, a man said to rival the Silver Sugar Viscount, had moved. She decided to head towards the town of Westall, north from here to sell some of her work. Since in the town of Lewiston, she'd probably get no business competing against actual Silver Sugar masters. They then arrived at a bit of a rundown confectionery shop, a place Anne seemed particularly interested in. Inside, she couldn't take her eyes away from one of the most beautiful pieces she had ever seen. Mithril then spotted a nodding fairy and tried to introduce himself. But the fairy Benjamin just quickly went back to sleep. Watching the two banter, Anne didn't notice the confectionery in front of her was slowly getting pulled away until she looked over coming face to face with a shrouded man. The man tried to run away with the piece but fell and broke it, quickly running away past Xiao, staring at the confectionery dust. The shop owner is upset at Anne, not knowing the other man was the cause of it. Even with Mithril trying to plead for her case, it's meaningless since Benjamin slept through the whole event. The man then gets closer and closer to Anne, and remembers she was the girl invited to come back by the king at the exhibition. Knowing her talent, he's decided to have her compensate him through labor. Xiao then pulls her, saying there's no need. But the man also pulls, saying he's not letting her go until he's paid back. So, Xiao draws his blade. But with Anne looking back and forth at the both of them, she decides to end the arguments and just work for the man. She doesn't believe it'll take long to make one sugar confection. Plus, it's her opportunity to learn how he made the beautiful piece from earlier. So, Anne began her work for the shop owner, Mr. Cat, working all day with Xiao watching her until she crashed on the bed. The next day, she and Mr. Cat worked just as hard because the new piece replacement was due in two days. Also, we learn Cat isn't his actual name, just a nickname someone gave him but now people know it more than his real name and he hates it. 
Xiao questions why Cat doesn't have any sugar confections on display, given he's supposed to be running a business here. Cat replies things are fine the way they are, as he makes enough to eat on his own. The buyer for the particular piece he's making now is using it for a wedding. Anne was shocked to hear the piece was only 50 bane, when it should be a more luxury item. Cat then answered that he only makes things for people he wants to make them for, but not all of them can afford to pay a high price. The person buying this sugar confection is a cobbler's daughter. Even at 50 bane, the price will be a difficult purchase for them. With their work still not finished, they somehow run out of silver sugar. Anne has prepared a batch that should be ready tomorrow, so Cat calls it a night. Anne lies in bed, wondering if what they have will truly be enough. She then pulls out apples to prepare more, but it's so cold her hands can barely take it. Beginning the heat prep, she accidentally drops her rock and is surprised to find Xiao standing before her. Lighting up the fire, he tells her she didn't come back to bed so he came to check and see why. Anne explains she wanted to prepare another barrel of sugar because if they were to run out, the piece wouldn't finish on time. Seeing her freeze, we're reminded once again that fairies cannot feel the cold, but they can feel warmth a little. It gives the same sensation as touching something fluffy. Anne then suddenly blushes with Xiao breathing on her hands to warm them. Her big eyes glimmer as she watches, but when the fire crackles, she quickly thanks him and says she's fine. Only, her red face tells us her heart is pounding. The next morning, Cat is surprised to find the barrel full of sugar. He then closes in on Anne again, telling her to have breakfast because an artisan's body is their greatest asset. Afterwards, the two of them get to work. Until this noblewoman, Viscountess Clay, barges in despite Mithril and Benjamin trying to hold her back. She apparently heard he was making a sugar confection for a cobbler's daughter and demanded to buy their piece for an exorbitant higher price. However, Cat had already told her several times he'd never sell her anything. The man made pieces for her servants, so she questioned why he wouldn't make anything for her daughter. Cat responded that she needed to remember how poorly she treated those servants, and even if the king bowed his head for one of his pieces, he still wouldn't make one for her. With the Viscountess kicked out, they spotted her driver as the man who destroyed Cat's original piece. Anne was determined to make sure no one would ruin this next one. Eventually, the new one was finished, and Cat wanted Anne to be the one to deliver it in the morning. He wanted her to see the expression of the person receiving it as a reward for her hard work, and she joyfully accepted. That night though, the man working under the Viscountess snuck in to nab it again, but Anne was ready right behind him. He tried escaping, but Xiao was behind the next door, and Cat behind the other. The man then attempted to destroy the piece again, but it was only Mithril and Benjamin underneath holding up sticks. So, both Cat and the thief were confused about where the confection was. Turns out, Anne delivered the confection before dinner last night, then set up the fake piece and laid in wait for the thief. Cat apologized for accusing Anne of breaking the first piece, but Anne was fine especially having seen the joyful expression on the cobbler's daughter's face. Knowing she was heading to Westall, Cat offered Anne his winter clothes since he was about to close shop here and move down south, tired of Lewiston's winters. With Anne about to take off, Cat tells her she should see Hugh since she's heading to Westall. The two of them apparently trained together at the same confectionery workshop. She was surprised this guy was actually a silver sugar master since there's no one on the list named Cat. But, as he said before, that's just a nickname. He then introduces himself as Alf Hingley, and this blows Anne's mind especially thinking about how this artist whom she admires has been calling her a little brat the entire time. However, Alf sternly told her that if she's an artist, she should never look up to anyone. An artist is one of a kind and second to absolutely no one. Writing off, Anne felt like Hugh had told her the same thing, that she shouldn't ape anyone else, and was thankful for what she learned from Kat. In Westall, Anne tried selling confectionaries through her pop-up shop, but not even a single piece has sold so far. Elsewhere, Hugh gives Downing a gift for his granddaughter's wedding. Downing mentions how he was hoping to see Anne again someday, so that way he could see her lovely fairy again. Turns out, Hugh had already met with her a few days ago, offering to take her in, but she refused, saying she wanted to walk on her own two feet. Downing laughed hearing this, knowing she refused an invitation from both the Mercury Workshop and the Silver Sugar Viscount. That felt so like her. Anne actually returned back to Lewiston, 
where a restaurant owner made sense of her bad sales in Westall. The domain is under the Silver Sugar Viscount, so outsiders tend not to do well business-wise there in the first place. Now understanding defeat, Anne agreed in a nervous sweat. While Shal and Mithril bicker over how stupid the decision was, with all the people staring at them though, the restaurant owner tells them there's nothing wrong with humans and fairies sitting at the same table, so if they have a problem, they can leave. Knowing business will be hard here in Lewiston given the peak season of sales through Pool Soul Day coming up, the owner actually suggests a coastal town south of here named Felix under Duke William Alburn. Due to some political events, Lord Downing explains House Alburn was allotted land under direct royal control. Revenue must be given from them to the royal family, and as proof of their loyalty, Duke Alburn must visit Lewiston once a month. Hugh is actually good friends with William, but when his father passed, he took on the role of those conditions. However, because William hasn't been visiting Lewiston lately, Lord Downing is looking to crush him, stating it's an act of rebellion, something Hugh wasn't so eager to hear. Turning back to the restaurant, Anne learns Duke Alburn had been looking for a sugar artisan. If this artisan can create the piece he desires, then he'll pay 1,000 crests as a reward. And on top of that, with the Duke being a descendant of one of the previous kings, his acknowledgement would give an artisan prestige. So, they headed to Phylax, the town that flourishes through trade as Highland's greatest port town. However, Xiao knows all that money is swallowed up by Lewiston through their agreement, and once a month, Duke Phylax must go see King Edmund. Inside the bleak castle, Anne and another artisan are asked to wait to have their pieces evaluated. The Duke then suddenly appears out of nowhere, telling them there's no need to bow, but to only show their confections. With two being presented, seeing her work, Anne is asked to stay while the other man is asked to leave. Observing it as a statue of a fairy, the Duke asked why she made it and Anne answered it's modeled after one of her friends traveling with her. He coldly accepted her answer and told her she could stay in the castle. She need only make a sugar confection that satisfies his expectations. She then asks what he wants made, so he presents the portrait of a beautiful fairy woman, one he wants Anne to give form to. As one of the servants leads Anne to the workshop, he remarks that her answer of calling a fairy a friend was well said, as the duke hates the practice of controlling fairies. That's why there are no fairy servants in the castle. After setting their stuff down in the designated workshop, Anne and Xiao headed towards one of the towers that had another portrait of the fairy, but wasn't expecting scumbag Jonas and two cronies behind him to be here. As she walked past them attempting to head inside, Jonas had the nerve to tell his boys she set him up. With all of them holding the honor of the Radcliffe School under their names, they were set on not letting Anne get away with disrespecting Jonas. However, with Shao drawing his blade, the three boys nervously left, giving the classic, we'll be the ones to win, kind of speech. Yup, more characters for me to hate. After seeing the portraits, Anne began her work. Three days passed and the piece was almost finished. Mithril commented on the fact that Shao was always off somewhere being sentimental every time she got busy. Apparently, he used to live in a castle just like this one. Hearing that, Anne wondered if he was talking about with Liz. Getting distracted? She accidentally wiped blue pigment all over her face, so she went outside to wash it off by a well. And staring at her reflection in the bucket water, Xiao's previous words of Liz's hair turning pale gold and freckles disappearing rang through her mind. She began to wonder if she would truly turn as beautiful as Xiao said. She couldn't imagine it. She felt like she'd always stay scrawny and gangly like a scarecrow. She then wondered what Liz was like, but was somehow certain she must have been beautiful. After all, Someone as beautiful as Xiao calls her beautiful. Feeling her heart beating, she then shrieked out loud, wondering why she felt jealous over a woman she never met, and began vigorously washing her face. Xiao then spotted her, joking about if she rubbed her nose that hard it would come off. Anne had forgotten to bring something to dry her face with, so Xiao slowly dragged one of his fingers across, causing her to jolt back and gasp. He then came up close to her face, only making it worse so she ran away bumping into Jonas. She told him her piece wasn't finished, so it wasn't ready for him to steal. But he was cocky, saying he had no need for it as he finished his own yesterday, along with the other two. Duke Alburn viewed all three of them and kicked the other two out, only permitting Jonas to stay, only telling Jonas it showed promise. 
but he needed to increase the level of accuracy. Jonas is supposedly also the first person the Duke allowed to stay in the castle after showing his peace. This put his eagle through the roof, as he showed off the tower he was upgraded to staying in. After finishing her piece, Anne immediately knocked out, so Xiao picked her up and tucked her into bed, whispering, You did well, Scarecrow. With the Duke staring at her piece the next day, he told her it wasn't right, but the feeling was much better than Jonas's. So, she just needed to increase the accuracy to satisfy him. He ordered her to stay in one of the other vacant towers, and now there was no need to take in any more artisans. Being shown her quarters, Jonas was of course surprised to find Anne had also passed as well. Having to compete again, neither of the two were willing to back down. Hearing the ringing of a bell, Anne can tell Jonas is calling the Duke to see his work again. So, Mithril decided to go take a look, but Xiao returned back with him. He apparently wanted to play a prank on Jonas because he looked depressed. With Anne's work finished, she decided to call the Duke in to examine it, but he wasn't pleased. He expressed cold fury, saying that she and Jonas didn't understand, and stormed out. That night, as she stared at the painting of the fairy, she tried to make sense of what wasn't working. Duke Alburn had even said it wasn't different from the last piece she made. This is when Xiao hypothesized that maybe the Duke wasn't looking for just a confection, otherwise hers should have sufficed. Despite all this, Anne wasn't discouraged, now attempting to make her piece look more realistic. Finishing once again, she decided to go look at the portrait to make sure it was truly accurate, but stumbled upon a disheveled Jonas exiting his room with a bruise on his face. He was shaking, having given up all hope because he couldn't understand the Duke's request. He wanted to quit so badly, he shouted at Anne and went back into his room. Presenting her piece to the Duke again, he just kept saying it was completely wrong, but unclear with the fine details. He just kept saying everything about it was wrong. Grabbing what he called a sham of an imitation, he shattered it, being unable to stand looking at the piece any further, only telling Anne to give it form. She stayed sitting depressed where the Duke left her. Both Xiao and Mithril thought giving up was the correct course of action. However, remembering the gleam in the Duke's eyes when he had first seen her work gave her confidence to keep going. Xiao had lived over a hundred years at this point, so he admits to Anne that over time he's become a lot more bitter. With Anne thinking of him and Liz, she asked Xiao what she was like. Thinking back, he remembered her blue eyes, long hair, and how mature she was, also quiet and thoughtful. Hearing that, Anne felt she herself was quite different from Liz. She thought things like, I'm not pretty, I'm childish, I'm boisterous, and I never think hard enough about anything. Xiao then turned towards her, shocked to see a tear dripping from her eye. She then went out to compose herself, but coming back, that piece of shit Jonas had come with Mithril's wing captive. He squeezed, causing Mithril to scream. Jonas's demand? He wanted Anne to tell Xiao she didn't want him with her anymore, and that he needed to leave this castle and never appear before her again. Oh my god, why do we keep dealing with this guy? I hate him. Get him off the show, please. He told her he'd give the wing back if she listened, but if she told Xiao, he'd rip the wing to shreds. Walking up the stairs, Xiao was still reflecting on why Anne had asked about Liz and why she cried earlier. But. Nothing could prepare anyone for her telling him exactly what Jonas told her to, without even looking at his face. He asked why, but with her shaking, she told him it was her fault and to not ask any further. So, he accepted and took off. Jonas wasn't done with her, however. He wanted the both of them to meet with Duke Alburn, where she wouldn't be allowed to oppose anything he had to say. With Jonas gone, Mithril apologized for being so careless. It was all his fault that the man Anne loved was gone now. Anne tried to deny her love for Xiao at first, but to Mithril, it was obvious. So she sat, bawling while uttering Xiao's name. Sitting below the moonlight, Xiao felt that perhaps everything always suddenly ended like this. Wandering the next day, he wondered where he should go next. Until a squad of fairy hunters looking for a top quality companion fairy surrounded him. However, with Xiao in a bad mood, he quickly dispatched all three of them. Before he could go for a killing blow, Hugh stopped him, saying if he killed a human, he'd get no protection. Hugh explained he was here because he had business at Phylax Castle, because the Duke right now is in a lot of trouble. We turned to the Duke's room, where Jonas asked the Duke to let him quit. Going near the fireplace, 
The Duke reminded him quitting was not permitted, and he pulled out the sword he used to beat Jonas with last time. Jonas pleaded as hard as he could to let Anne do all the work instead, so she wagered she would complete it without fail, something the Duke could agree to. Afterwards, Jonas handed the wing back and left in defeat. Heading to the castle, Hugh explained that the Duke of Phylax hasn't visited Lewiston for the last year and a half, meaning he's been shirking his royal duty. Earl Downing finds it unforgivable and has requested the Duke's subjugation. The King was overcome and had to give him permission. So, if Hugh isn't able to reason with William to explain himself, the Earl will come with soldiers, putting everyone in the castle in danger. Hugh doesn't want his dear friend to die, but before he became the Silver Sugar Viscount, he would even often make sugar confections for the woman by the Duke's side. That's why he knows William isn't a bad guy. In the Duke's room, Hugh invited him to visit Lewiston, explaining the severity of the situation. But the Duke just lied depressed, saying he wasn't going. Then Hugh brought up Lady Christina could come with him if he wanted, making William get up, threatening Hugh to leave immediately. So Hugh exited. During all this, Anne kept observing the portrait, now asking Mithril why the confection had to be modeled after this fairy in particular. The daylight then shined over the portrait, making Anne realize something she'd been missing the entire time. This fairy still had both her wings attached, meaning she'd never been made to serve anyone. The two then hatched up a plan. Mithril would leave the castle to go find Shao and tell him the truth, while Anne would ask the Duke more personal questions about the fairy and the portrait. Getting an audience with the Duke alone, Anne asked to learn more information about the fairy and the portrait, believing it was necessary to give the confection form. To the Duke, however, this greatly disturbed his memories. So if she learned everything she could and was still unable to create it, she'd have to pay with her life. Even hearing his threat, she was fully prepared to succeed. So with that, he confessed the fairy's name was Christina, or Lealis Sil Eril. Anne got up suddenly to ask why he didn't call her by her fairy name, but this was actually a desire from Christina. From the moment she was born, she had wanted a human-like name. She gazed out idly at the wave crests from which she'd been born. He felt her being caught and hurt by humans was lamentable, so he brought her back to the castle. But Anne gasped hearing how she died and vanished a year and a half ago, and now it was apparent the Duke was still in love with her. Back in the carriage, Hugh asked Shao how long fairies born of the sea live. Apparently, sea fairies' lives are unstable, so it varies. Some live for hundreds of years and some vanish after only a few. Even with sugar confections, the best ones made by someone at Hugh's level could only extend a fairy's life by a few weeks to a few months. Understanding the gravity of this, Hugh now knew William's pain from losing his lover. Anne then asked the Duke if she could bring her tools into his room. She wants to ask questions about Christina while she works to give it form. Back at Hugh's carriage, they suddenly stop knowing the Earl is just ahead of them. He tries to reason with the Earl at camp, but to no avail. Salim then came up to Chow with a canister, containing Mithril who had eaten all the soup inside. Mithril's eyes watered as he quickly explained everything that happened in detail and how Anne had been aching to see him this entire time. Chow then shoved Mithril back into the canister and bolted out towards the castle. Anne worked, explaining she wanted to get Lady Christina correct in every facet, from height to expression, thinking of how the person most important to herself always seemed to look at her in a bad mood. Eventually, one of the servants came to the door, telling the Duke more than 300 servants had surrounded the castle. However, the Duke only told his servant to tell them to wait because he had to see this confection through. Anne asked why this was happening, but was simply commanded by the Duke to work, threatened even. To Duke Alburn, Christina was the only one who ever understood him. Anne continued to work, wanting to make the one thing he desired, and to depict Christina's feelings exactly as he remembered. Then suddenly, Shal appeared at the door, huffing from his exhaustive hurry. He then quickly grabbed onto Anne, saying he would be taking her back, and that her idiocy was astounding, making her tear up in joy. She apologized for the horrible things she said, but Shal understood. The most important thing was to leave the castle before the attack began. The Duke, of course, wasn't going to let her leave. However, Shao drew his blade ready to cut him down. Shao was then shocked to hear Anne was serious about continuing her work, but he smiled and withdrew his blade. With the castle completely surrounded, Anne still worked, and with the confection truly taking form, the Duke's eyes began to glimmer. 
the true purpose he requested something exactly like her was to hopefully gaze at it and bring Christina back to life. He still remembers the day she disappeared right in front of him. Her form had turned into motes of light and melted into thin air. He had it set in his heart to give her form once again. Xiao simply told him it was impossible, and the only thing that could be born from this piece is a strange, warped fairy, which deeply upset Duke Alburn. The castle then began shaking from the attempted siege outside, but Anne was still determined to finish. Despite Xiao disapproving, he accepted her wish with a soft touch. He decided to protect her desires by fending off the soldiers outside the room. Putting in the last pieces of Christina's beautiful translucent eyes, the Duke cried at the perfect depiction of his beloved. This is exactly what he wanted, even with him acknowledging how foolish he might sound. Despite this, Anne gave him belief, saying no one has proven for sure a fairy couldn't be brought back to life, and these words of comfort made him happy. Handing Anne her reward and acknowledging her talent, she ran to Xiao, tripping down the stairs and falling into his arms. With Hugh and the soldiers heading upstairs to subjugate the Duke, Xiao then held Anne close. He admitted he was so worried about her, and looking up at him, she told him she did want him to stay by her side. Back at the restaurant in Lewiston, the owner had heard about Anne's skills being acknowledged and that now the Duke of Phylax would be living under the supervision of Earl Downing. A happy end to the story. On Pool Soul Day, Anne lit a candle for her mother and set down the confection she created in her honor. With that, the three then enjoyed the food stalls of the festival. Heading back to Lewiston, Anne reminisced on first arriving in the town nearly a year ago, but had to stop her horse at the sudden appearance of another oncoming one. Realizing it was Cat, Xiao made a sly joke about Cat's hibernating here in the fall. Back at the restaurant, the owner asks what Anne's been up to in the past year. Turns out, after wintering in Lewiston, they had gone around visiting little towns and villages selling sugar confections. So now, she's back here for the annual exhibition. Sitting down with Kat, he asked if she noticed something strange with the sugar apples this year. And she did. Every sugar apple tree they saw had poorly set flowers. This year's crop was terrible. Kat then explained to avoid potential chaos between factions of different schools, Hugh decreed this year the harvest and refinement of sugar apples by individuals would be forbidden. Instead, all sugar apples throughout the kingdom would be harvested in the name of the Silver Sugar Viscount, then refined. And only those sugar artisans who participate in the process will be allotted silver sugar commensurate with their labor. But it isn't as simple as asking Hugh for sugar. The Radcliffe workshop had already gathered a majority of all the sugar apples throughout the kingdom, while the Page and Mercury workshops had taken the remains. So the only way to obtain silver sugar is to assist in refinement at one of the schools. However, Anne hadn't heard about this at all. The members of the Radcliffe school should have informed her, but instead, they only harassed her at every town they were in, which frustrated Cat to no end. They're definitely jealous of her recognition by the Duke of Phylax. So, they made their way to the main Radcliffe school, where we see Jonas again, who jumps at the sight of Anne. But the boy in charge of reception, Sammy Jones, pulls him out of the way to welcome the famous Alf Hingley. However, as any of us would expect, he's completely rude to Anne because she's a woman. After learning she's Anne Halford, he got more stern, remembering she's the one that set Jonas up last year. There's also a rumor that she seduced Hugh and potentially the Duke of Phylax to earn their favors. Silently in the back, Xiao was getting ready to draw his sword on Sammy. But everything came to peace with the arrival of Keith Powell, who was apparently acquainted with Kat. After greeting Anne kindly, he was stunned, fixated on Xiao's beautiful looks. Even though the rules here are worker fairies only, Keith will allow Xiao to stay as long as he allows himself to model for his piece this year for the exhibition. Anne is about to turn Keith down, not wanting to objectify Xiao, but Xiao stops her, willing to do what it takes to help her get into the school. With Anne and her friends being shown to their room, she wonders about Keith's identity and why he's so valued here. At the call of a morning rooster, Anne scurries to be ready quickly, so Xiao compares her to a squirrel. She's happy to hear it since a squirrel is much cuter than a scarecrow. However, with her lack of calmness, Xiao only sees her as a squirrel darting around for food. Looking at her mirror, she wondered if Xiao would prefer her hair down better, 
He then suddenly comes up to her and touches it, saying it looks as it always does, no issues at all. Seeing his face, she definitely got flustered and ran out the room. On her way to work, Keith opens his door to greet her. It turns out he knew her mother Emma. He had met her when he was about four or five years old and was very surprised a female sugar master existed. His own father, Edward Powell, is also a silver sugar master and recognizes that name as Edward was the previous silver sugar viscount. So that's why Keith is recognized by many. Edward served as a wonderful viscount for over 20 years, but died six months before Anne's mother due to illness. With Keith's father having come from the page school, Anne asked why he was here. Keith answered he didn't want to receive special treatment as his father's son, but instead as just another artisan. However, people still treated him special here. He respected his father, but Keith felt his own situation was always uncomfortable and restrictive. Especially while his father was alive, he couldn't even enter the exhibition, because if he had won, the critics would have gossiped that his victory was due to nepotism. And if he lost, they would have gossiped he was a failure despite being the Silver Sugar Viscount's son. But that ended last year. Now that the mourning period has ended, he can prove his talents. He then brought Xiao to his room, who was ready to fulfill his promise. However, Xiao was extremely displeased that the other members of the school didn't inform Anne about this year's situation. So as it stands, she doesn't even have silver sugar to work with at the moment. Learning this now, Keith commented the students here were cowardly and disgraceful, but he is glad Anne is entering this year because he knows none of the other artisans will be competition for him. He then reveals some dark news. This may be Anne's last year to be an artisan if she doesn't become a silver sugar master due to the jealousy she's garnered from artisans all around. Keith asks Xiao to keep this a secret from her so that she doesn't feel any additional pressure. He wants to compete with her fairly. Entering the workshop, Anne and Mithril are astonished to see the hustle and bustle of all the artists refining the sugar, but also that there wasn't a single other woman here. Kat then appeared, mentioning women are transgressors who turned their backs on the will of God, which is why they are not allowed to make the sacred food sugar confections. When God created a woman and a man, the wish was for them to rule over the earth. However, the human woman fell in love with the king of fairies and ended up vowing to serve him. The one who cleansed humanity of the woman's crimes and freed the world from the fairies was ancestor King Cedric, a story Anne wasn't really aware of since she never attended church. Kat added it was just a story, but among artisans, it remained the reason that women shouldn't meddle in this work. But also, this work is physically demanding for women as well. Next to arrive was Master Marcus Radcliffe, Jonas, and Sammy. Kat didn't take too kindly to him, since Master Radcliffe's workshop was the very reason he and Anne were informed about this year's working decree so late. Master Radcliffe puts Kat in charge of overseeing the refinement as a whole, so he takes his leave. He then talks to Anne, and we learn he's also Jonas's uncle. The only words he has for her is to keep up with everyone else at the same pace. Otherwise, she won't be given any sugar. However, he's very harsh with Jonas, letting him know if he loses to Anne again, Keith will become the only candidate as the next head of the workshop. Getting into a work-ready outfit, Anne asks Kat for his orders. So, he sends her to one of the big cauldrons. But as she struggles to work, a man picks her up and takes her out, not wanting her to hurt herself. Elliot Collins introduces himself as an ally of all women, and he's also a silver sugar master who's standing in for the head of the page workshop. Next to introduce herself is the daughter of the page workshop headmaster, Bridget Page. She's Elliot's fiance, but enough introductions. Anne has to get back to work, although she stops with all the guys staring at her. So Kat scolds them, saying anyone who's able should be allowed to work here. Watching her work, Bridget finds it odd that a woman is both being acknowledged as an artisan and allowed to work here. She calls it laughable and walks off. After work, an exhausted Anne gets in line for her dinner. Instead of serving her, Bridget just sighs, asking how a girl like her could dress like that. The rule is one plate per person. However, Anne has guests with her and would like plates for them too. Keith intervenes, giving permission. But when Xiao comes onto the scene, Bridget blushes with the beautiful fairy before her asking for a serving. When Anne and Xiao head out, Bridget couldn't help but stare. Inside their room, Xiao couldn't take his eyes off of Anne, who breathed a deep sigh of exhaustion. There was a knock on the door, 
where Jonas was given orders from his uncle to tell Anne where the sugar apples were. Staring at the apples in the barrel, Anne was tired. So tired, in fact, she decided to take a little nap, but woke up to Shao carrying her back. He laid her in bed and gave her a light kiss for the night. Remembering when she told him to leave her back at Felix castle, he now understood perhaps he was the one who didn't want them to be separated. Stepping outside to get Anne some water, Bridget commented it was terrible she made him work late at night. She tried getting in Shao's way, saying if he didn't like serving Anne, he could serve her instead. She'd let him live in a nice room and even give him lots of sugar confections. Shao scoffed right past her, bluntly stating she only wants him as a pet, and closed the door on her. Six days later, Anne had a scuffle at the refinery, getting shoved off the cauldron because she was taking too long. She just wanted the sugar to be high quality. However, Sammy mocked her, saying with this year's sugar being mass-produced, no one would care. Anne stood on her principles, questioning if every year's sugar after this would be made of inferior quality. Keith then pulled her away, attempting to calm Anne down. He reasoned that everything was being overseen by both Kat and Elliot, so they'd eventually fix things. This works, so Keith shifts the conversation to ask what piece Anne is going to make. She hadn't had time to even think about it, so she asked why Elliot wanted Shao as his model. He answered it's because the royal family tends to favor sugar confections with a fairy motif. If one visits the head temple of the Church of St. Lewiston Bell, there's a book about the royal family and sugar confections. Seeing Keith's artistic depiction of Shao, Anne thinks it's amazing how his essence truly comes through. Every piece has been crafted so delicately. She then questioned if she had made it. Would the results have been this good? Looking at the window, she spotted Shao with Bridget. But why? Bridget had discovered Shao wasn't actually serving Anne. Shao doesn't want to have any sort of conversation with her, but she stops him, and with tears, she runs into his body. Seeing this makes Anne clench her teeth. Bridget unloaded onto Shao that her fiancé was decided a long time ago by her father, and she didn't understand what love was. But seeing Shao, her heart raced so fast, she didn't know what to do. She confessed her love to him, and that's when Keith called Anne onto their next task. However, Shao pushed Bridget off. He asked her what she would have done if she were in love with someone like Kat or Keith. She admitted she would be too embarrassed to confess something like this. So once again, Shao understood she wasn't embarrassed now because he was just a fairy, being treated no different than a second-class citizen. If she wanted him, she had better steal his wing and give him an order for love. Walking with Keith, Anne was fixated on why Shao and Bridget were alone together. Keith noticed something was wrong, so he took her hand and told her they should go for a run. And with her cheering up, Shao walked in on them. Keith explained with them getting to work, she should run and leave her worries behind which only left a stir in Shao's heart. In the evening, Anne decided to take a walk with Mithril to clear her mind, as things with her and Shao haven't been feeling right. For the past week, he spent just about every night modeling for Keith. Jonas and Kathy then appeared, with Kathy beginning her smack talk, but he quieted her. He declared that this year, he was going to make a proper piece, one that he truly wants to create. Seeing Anne's expression though, Jonas feels as if she doesn't even see him as competition. He's sure of it now. He hates her. Thinking about a piece she wants to create, she's now curious as to why the royal family favors fairy motif sugar confections. The next day, she and Shao headed to the church temple, but their silence together is unusually awkward. Shao thinks this meekness isn't like her. So, Anne brings up that she thought he'd be too busy on a date with Bridget today. However, Shao doesn't even know who that is. Anne then tries to jog his mind, saying the two of them embraced yesterday afternoon. Now realizing the blonde girl's name, he brings up that she kept chattering on about whether she'd buy him or not. So he told her if she wanted him, she better steal his wing. There have always been humans like that. Anne is relieved, thinking that was the reason he seemed out of sorts yesterday. But Shao responded if he had to pick a reason, the reason would be Anne. At the church, the priest declines their entry into the library because it's under renovation at the moment. The particular book she's looking for, however, is written in Old Highlandian script, something the priest believes she wouldn't be able to read anyways. After the priest leaves, Anne and Shao gaze up on the art on the ceiling that depicts their founding king, Cedric, versus the fairy king. Shao then mentions the fairy king's name, Reselva Cyril Sash, 
It's likely the obsidian he was born from had always known. He can even read the old Highlandian script on the ceiling. It reads that King Cedric was the Fairy King's slave, a truth that makes Anne jolt. But the Fairy King, because of Cedric's bravery and sincerity, regarded him as a friend and set him free. And Cedric respected the Fairy King for his integrity and strength and considered him a friend. The two kings searched for a path that fairies and humans could walk together. But while the humans revered King Cedric and fairies felt the same for the Fairy King, the two races hated each other. War broke out. Destiny became twisted. The Fairy King was defeated and Cedric won. Cedric grieved the death of his friend very deeply. In memoriam, he had a sugar confection made in his friend's image and offered up a prayer. He wished that the world they dreamed of would one day come to pass. A power which brought great fortune came to dwell within that sugar confection. Anne was saddened, knowing the story the church taught about the woman who had fallen for the fairy king was probably completely false. Something that's been rewritten for convenience's sake. That's history, isn't it? Shao didn't blame King Cedric for the state of the world though. He may have wanted fairies to coexist with humans, but he wasn't able to. So being the victor, the world became as it is. Shao felt the differences between the races were vast, but Anne didn't, at least for herself. Shao concludes the reasons the royal family favors fairy sugar confections are Cedric's regrets, an atonement for not being able to carry on his will. As he walked away, with Anne locked on to the glimmer of his wing, she's found it. Inspiration for this year's peace. Back in her room, she begins, wanting to give form to what the founding king and the fairy king had held within them, the wish they shared. The days went by with Anne working and crafting her piece. During break, Keith offered her a drink. She was a little extra exhausted because she had finished her piece last night. Just in the nick of time, since the sugar confectionery exhibition is the day after tomorrow. Master Radcliffe then appeared, hearing she finished. And per regulations, he must conduct an inspection on her work. Entering her room, Mithril was trying to sneak a taste of her silver sugar. Apparently, all fairies can easily tell the difference between different sugars. And looking at the open barrel, Sammy stares at it for some reason. Anne then unleashed her piece, and everyone was taken aback seeing the climbing roses that symbolized the royal family, being wrapped within a fairy's wing like the crescent shape of the moon. Keith had confidence in his work. However, after seeing Anne's, he's a little uneasy now. Hearing this shocks Sammy. That night, Jonas came to her door. Apparently, Sammy told him Master Radcliffe was looking for her and that she should go to the workroom. However, they were surrounded by Sammy and his men, with Master Radcliffe nowhere to be found. Jonas had no idea about this. Sammy then told him he found it infuriating that this girl was about to cheat her way to the royal medal. He hated the idea that she would be insulting Keith, so he was prepared to boil her hands in the pot. Kathy took this opportunity to free Jonas and he ran out of the building into Anne's room to inform Shao. Shao then dipped immediately. Right before her hands reach the water, Shao makes it just in time to draw his blade on these bastards. Before slicing Sammy's head off, Anne begs him to stop. With the sword right on his neck, Shao swears to one day kill them all. After Sammy and his cronies leave, Shao blames himself for not being there for her, for allowing himself to be separated from her. She cried into his chest because she was just so scared, and he consoled her, telling Anne she was all right now. Later, Master Radcliffe apologized on behalf of his workshop, but they were all shocked to hear Jonas would be the one expelled from Radcliffe. Anne tried explaining it wasn't Jonas, but instead Sammy Jones. However, Master Radcliffe got angry because it was Sammy and the others who made the report. Oh my god. Now there's someone I hate more than Jonas. Master Radcliffe took Sammy's words seriously, given he had been working at this shop since the age of 12. He could never believe Sammy would lie to him. Mithril tried explaining Sammy was at fault as well, making Master Radcliffe only more angry. As he was about to punish Mithril, Shao stopped him, once again reiterating Sammy was at fault. So, Master Radcliffe kicked out Anne's party and Jonas's as well. Taking her leave, Keith and Kat came out to check on her saying they'd make sure Sammy gets what he deserves. And as they exited, Bridget only stared at Shao. They went back to that one restaurant again, and with Jonas entering and leaving seeing Anne, she ran after him. She thanked him for saving her, but all he did was run off. Shao watched Anne sleep that night, 
and started to remember how happy she was when Keith had complimented her work. She was so excited then. Had there been no incident yesterday, the Radcliffe workshop might have become her home. But he's more relieved with things as they are now. He knew this was selfish. Mithril then came into the room to explain something serious had happened. The silver sugar in Anne's barrels was different. Mithril had a nibble just now and could tell the sugar wasn't Anne's. But the Radcliffe workshop's mass-produced sugar. Shao evaluated it himself and tossed it out of anger knowing the truth. He told Mithril to keep this a secret from Anne and to let her join the exhibition tomorrow regardless. He himself was going to go on a mission to find her silver sugar. Back at the Radcliffe workshop that night, Xiao, Kat, and Keith visited Elliot. To absolve Anne of the bad sugar, they needed both proof and a witness that the sugar had been stolen, so they wanted a smooth talker like Elliot to help. He let them in, and they found his fiancée Bridget after many drinks complaining that everyone spoils Anne and gives her all the attention. However, she jolts up hearing Xiao tell her she understood nothing. Anne did everything by herself and never gave up no matter what. He then told Bridget the only one being spoiled was her, causing her to sit down depressed. Keith and Kat explained Anne's situation with the replaced sugar. They needed eyewitness proof, and the only one who had that was Bridget. She saw everything, who they were, what they did, and what happened to Anne's silver sugar. Shao demanded answers, but Bridget refused to give any. At the exhibition, Anne asked Mithril if Shao really had hiccups so badly that he went out to find herbs. She didn't quite believe it, even though Mithril was adamant that was the reason he wasn't here. Keith then arrived and apologized because Bridget wouldn't tell them what she knew. So Shao stayed behind to persuade her. He was truly saddened that he wouldn't be able to compete against Anne fairly. Anne was confused, but before Keith could explain, Hugh commanded him to stay in his position. A letter had come to Hugh this morning. It read that Anne Halford was not someone worthy of being called a sugar artisan. She had no skills in refining silver sugar, and the proof is that the silver sugar she brought is the mass-produced kind made during this year's special refining mandate. Keith tried to defend her, citing Hugh should know better than anyone. However, Earl Downing quieted him, stating that as long as there's an accusation, it should be investigated or else it'll brew trouble later. So, Anne gave them permission to inspect her barrels. Opening them up for inspection, Anne was distraught, seeing the sugar that was not hers. Master Radcliffe declared the obvious, which was that the sugar was the same kind as what was mass-produced at his workshop. Back in Bridget's room, Shao told her if she didn't answer, he'd cut her down. Bridget accepted though, knowing she held all the cards. Anne would fail to become a silver sugar master, and Shao would be disposed of as a human-killing fairy. He'd never see Anne again, which is exactly what she wanted. So, he offered his wing for the truth, and she held it against her cheek. She then commanded him to kiss her. So he did, and she lost herself, embracing him closely. No, no, no! This wasn't supposed to happen! Back at the exhibition, the people called for Anne's disqualification, and that piece of shit Sammy smirked at her downfall. The Earl commanded their silence. With the arrival of King Edmund II, hearing the news, the king very matter-of-factly told Anne if her sugar was nowhere to be found, she'd be disqualified. But before that, he asked to see her piece. Not for an assessment, but simply because his wife asked to see it. So Anne unveiled a piece that truly captured everyone in awe. She then asked the king if there was any fairy he could trust. So they summoned their servant, Clifford. She broke a piece, causing everyone to gasp. But Anne knew fairies could taste the difference between silver sugars. Thus, Clifford ate it, remarking the taste to be quite delicious. He announced it to be made from exceptionally high-quality silver sugar, different from the mass-produced ones. Everyone was shocked she was willing to break her peace just to prove her innocence. After putting the cover back on, Anne was surprised to see Xiao had arrived with Bridget. She was allowed an audience with the king, where she explained the whereabouts of Anne's sugar. She then pointed inside the tent that held the barrels with Sammy Jones's name on them. Sammy shuddered nervously as Bridget explained the barrels contained sugar not refined by him, but Anne Halford, certainly shocking Master Radcliffe. She ordered Sammy's barrels be brought out, where Clifford verified the sugar was exactly the same as what was used in Anne's piece. Master Radcliffe ran to Sammy, begging for answers. Sammy apologized, feeling inadequate in his own work, but Master Radcliffe would not accept such shame brought upon his school. 
he begged the king for atonement. But King Edmund only responded by calling the workshop pathetic and to be gone from his sight. Then told Anne she no longer needed to leave. Anne thanked Bridget for the help. However, Bridget told her there was no need since she got what she wanted in return. The exhibition then began and everyone revealed their pieces. The king had taken notice of Keith's depiction of Shao, describing it as valiant and impeccable. He truly complimented Keith's piece, but an imitation of the real world could never compete with Anne's motif beyond this world. Even the fault where she had broken the flower appears beautiful in his eyes. Keith also agreed with him. So with that, King Edmund II announced Anne to receive this year's royal medal and bestowed her the title of Silver Sugar Master. Anne could hardly believe it, even with Mithril cheering by her side. Accepting the medal, she thought of how it honored her mother and swore to the king she would live as an artisan for all her life. After that, Keith congratulated her and swore he'd get next year's medal. Then they could compete again. Anne then thanked Keith for helping her push herself, but he said Shao was the one who needed to be thanked. Since he had persuaded Bridget, Anne ran to show Shao the medal, which made him smile. He then responded, you have acquired your future. Now, you don't need me anymore. Trying to walk away, Anne stopped him, asking what he was talking about. He told her he couldn't be with her anymore. She began shaking, asking if he didn't want to be with her anymore. They stood still without him answering for a moment until he suddenly embraced her. He whispered, I didn't want to be separated. Then Anne fell to the floor, watching the man she loved enter into the carriage of another woman. She wondered why this was happening, so Elliot explained Shao gave up his wing to get the whereabouts of her silver sugar from Bridget. For Anne, he sold his freedom. Watching Shao enter the carriage, Anne tried running after him, but was stopped by a horse crossing. She kept running after, begging Shao not to go, but it was too late. Anne sat on the floor in tears. When Keith, Mithril, and Cat rushed to the scene, Elliot playfully explained the shock was too much for her. Cat started roughing Elliot up, annoyed he'd let Bridget take Shao's wing. However, Elliot held no responsibility, since Bridget and Shao did all the negotiating. Anne stared at her royal medal, questioning why Shao would go that far for her. Even if things hadn't worked out this year, she could have always tried again next year. That's when Keith explained, no there wouldn't have been. He had already told Xiao that if she didn't become a silver sugar master this year, she wouldn't be able to acquire any more silver sugar moving forward. Anne was shocked to learn this. The entire time, she didn't understand anything. Looking for solutions, both Mithril and Keith suggested she go to the page workshop to talk things out with Bridget, but she was unsure of how she'd get in. So Elliot proposed she work for them as a silver sugar master at the shop and he might be able to create an opportunity for her to get Xiao back. Anne was a little reluctant, knowing Elliot clearly had an ulterior motive in all of this, but she was determined to go wherever Xiao was. The night before heading out, Anne stared at her medal, the same medal Xiao helped her earn. Then, with a knock at the door, Hugh appeared. Coming on behalf of a request from Kat, Hugh asked Anne if she wanted him to use his authority as Silver Sugar Viscount to retrieve Xiao. Cat felt responsible because he led her to the Radcliffe workshop. In her heart, Anne wanted Xiao back by her side, but refused Hugh's offer. She wanted to atone for her foolishness on her own. Otherwise, there'd be no point to any of this. She wants to free Xiao and rescue him with her own strength. If she didn't, even with the royal medal Xiao gave her, she wouldn't be able to proudly declare herself as a Silver Sugar Master. This is when Hugh said, It's my win. Confusing Anne. Turns out, he and Cat made a bet on whether or not she'd use Hugh's Viscount authority. And now that Cat's lost, he'll have to do anything Hugh asks. Anne was so embarrassed they used her situation for a little game. However, he was happy he'd have fun getting to tease his best friend. But on a serious note, he told Anne she needed to spend the coming year establishing herself as a Silver Sugar Master. Otherwise, the people would see it as a fluke. Especially since she was a woman, the eyes of the world would be harsh. In spite of all that, getting Xiao back would be the first step in calling herself a Silver Sugar Master. On the way to the workshop, Elliot whimsically exclaimed, Traveling alone with a girl sets my heart leaping, completely ignoring Mithril even being there. He then asked Anne if Xiao was her sweetheart, and when she denied it, 
He called their one-sided love heartbreaking. They first met with Orlin Langston, the head of artisans at the Page Workshop, who was surprised to learn Anne was a Silver Sugar Master. However, having no additional words for her, he walked away. Elliot then introduced Anne to the master of the workshop, Glenn Page, and seeing her, Bridget gave the nastiest glare. Glenn apologized for meeting while bedridden, as he has an illness of the heart, but he truly acknowledged her skills in earning a royal medal, and this made Bridget squeeze at her dress. Anne informed Glenn she was here for Xiao, so he offered to give him back to her on the condition she fulfilled what he needed here. Given their shop was the smallest, he was grateful to have a silver sugar master like her serve as their new head of artisans. Anne was shocked, and so was Bridget. Bridget's father had always told her a woman should never get into sugar artisan work. However, his true purpose in forbidding his daughter was because she was the daughter of a schoolmaster. Her position would be far worse if she had pursued the craft of confectionery work. So, she accepted the heartache from his words. But she was even more hurt to know he would be taking away her fairy. Glenn was stern with his decision, telling Bridget one day she would marry Elliot and inherit the school. That was her duty, and she couldn't take that fairy with her. Bridget shrieked, but with subservient tears, she once again accepted her role as Glenn Page's daughter. Bridget ran back to her room, upset that her father and Elliot only ever thought of the workshop, never considering how she felt. As she smashed the decor in the room, Xiao was as emotionless as ever. She knew Xiao wanted to see Anne, so she presented his wing, reminding Xiao who he belonged to at the moment, ordering him not to see Anne for any reason. She then squeezed the wing to harm him knowing outside the window, Anne could watch them embrace. Later, Anne was shown to the workshop. It was small and modest, housing only five artisans outside of Anne. There were some fairies who did housework in the main building, but that was pretty much it. Truthfully, the page workshop was in dire straits especially given their confection orders have noticeably declined. This is why they had high hopes Anne would rebuild the workshop. Anne got up that night, unable to sleep. She decided to visit the workshop, contemplating on how to rebuild it. And that's when Shal appeared, lighting her up. He saw her from the window and warned her not to dress like that with her front untied. So she frantically tried to tie it up. Walking forward, he asked why she came here, knowing his decision to give his wing was of his own accord and had nothing to do with her. But she was still determined to set him free no matter what. He then pulled her in front of him so he could tie her lace, since she couldn't quite get it. She then told Xiao she wanted to stay with him, and that if she couldn't set him free, she wouldn't be able to call herself a Silver Sugar Master, since she only earned her medal because of him. Xiao's response was to call her an idiot, but then he pulled her in to hold her close, accepting if that's what she needed to feel proud of herself, then he wouldn't drive her away anymore. He's never been saved by anyone before, so with her saying she'd save him, he asked what he needed to do, and she told him to wait for her. The morning came, and Anne just had to wake up Mithril to tell him she met with Xiao. She was so happy he said he'd wait for her. Mithril was surprised, since Xiao's usual response would be something like, No one asked for your help. Get out. Outside, the rest of the workshop members, Valentine, Nadir, and King were surprised to meet Anne, with Nadir ecstatic to see she had a fairy with her. With Elliot doing introductions, they recognized her as the girl who created the confection for the Duke of Phylax, and were surprised that a new Silver Sugar Master like her would work at their tiny shop. None of them had objections, given the Master had agreed to this. Inside the workshop, Anne had no idea how to operate as the head, so she just told them to continue their work from yesterday. As they began working at their stations, Anne took this opportunity to get a sense of the current situation. She first checked on Orlin who took on a task to make a horse for his client. She figured his issue was he didn't understand he needed to ask more about what his client wanted. Next, she saw King's beautiful flower work, and his issue being he's uncomfortable around women. Then suddenly, Valentine asked what he should do next, since they didn't have any additional orders to fulfill. She prompted him to help one of the other members finish their work, but he refused, stating one shouldn't interfere with another's work. This is where Anne found out the next problem, the artisans here didn't work together to accomplish assignments. Orlin then explained that the head of artisans' job up to this point was to manage the silver sugar, deal with clients, and ascertain whether the sugar confections produced would shame the page workshop. If not, she was to bring the finished product to Glenn and get a seal of approval. Anne was shocked at the tediousness here compared to other workshops. That night, in the dining hall, Anne met with the two serving fairies, Dana and Hal. 
They were twins, born from the same tree at the same time. Anne invited them to have dinner with her, but given their status as fairy servants, they declined, which disappointed Anne. Elliot then appeared to ask what Anne had thought of her first day on the job. She looked down, having now understood each artist here takes complete responsibility for their work alone. Elliot knew that, of course, as it had been the Page School's convictions for 300 years now. But still, this bothered Anne. Elliot then showed Anne the school's promissory notes, roughly 10,000 Cressworth, with this land as collateral, which certainly shocked her. Things had been tight here since the last master of the school's time. If they couldn't repay the debt within the year, half of this place would be taken away. They had no means to repay it at the moment. So Elliot tried to negotiate it earlier today. He then told Anne to keep this a secret, because even though Glenn knew about the debt, he didn't know they were in a bind about repayment. The lenders are worried about the future of the workshop given Glenn's illness. Elliot was bothered by things here at the workshop too, but couldn't quite put his finger on it. So for now, he wanted to figure out their debt and leave the workshop to Anne. In Bridget's room, Xiao suggested she at least have her meals with everyone else. She seemed lonely, but she didn't want to. She preferred being alone with Xiao. Resting her head on his chest, she commanded him to hold her. And despite feeling disgust, he did as she commanded, even carrying her to her bed at her order. After she fell asleep, he decided to go outside and followed Anne into the workshop, jump scaring her a little. Knowing she was determined to work, Xiao finally smiled again. Everything was great, until Bridget woke up from her nap, bursting in the shop seeing the two of them together. Despite Bridget's command for him not to see Anne, he had no intention of obeying, so he accepted his due punishment. Bridget was just upset he wouldn't consider her feelings. However, given she was just his master not considering his feelings, he felt it appropriate to do the same for her. With tears in her eyes, Bridget rushed to punish Xiao using his wing and Anne ran after her. But inside her room, Bridget couldn't find the wing in the secret place she had hid it. Elliot then came by to inform her master Glenn had it. So with Orlin carrying Glenn, he followed up by adding someone placed it on his pillow. Bridget was upset because her father said it would be fine for her to have it until she got married. However, he just told her the truth. Her ways were intolerable, locking the fairy in her room, letting no one but herself interact with him. He wanted her to be sensible, but she stormed out. For the time being, Xiao was now Glenn's servant. So he ordered Xiao to interact with Anne in moderation. Mithril was certainly relieved to see Xiao again, since he imagined Bridget doing horrible things to him. However, Xiao told him his imagination was overboard. The school then received Master Radcliffe and Keith Powell visiting. Certainly a surprise to Anne, Master Radcliffe was here to check on his old friend, but also to see if they were participating for selection in the Holy Beginnings Festival. However, Glenn denied this, as his father also rejected their school's participation as well when he was still alive. Keith then came forward to apologize to Glenn, but Glenn thought nothing wrong of his choices to work with another school. Anne and Keith went to chat on their own, where Keith explained Jonas had disappeared and no one has been able to get in touch with him. Anne was curious about what the selection for the festival was. So Keith explained that every year for the Holy Beginnings Festival, sugar confections are set out in the Church of St. Louis in Bell. The job of making the confections is entrusted to a selected workshop in advance. It's a great honor to be chosen, and the kingdom's religion will pay the selected workshop 10,000 crests, on top of which that school becomes popular, so lots of commissions come in afterwards. Valentine and Nadir appeared, with Nadir wondering if Keith was Anne's boyfriend. She told him to stop teasing, but Keith didn't mind the title. Learning who they were meeting was Keith Powell, the two quickly left without even a handshake. Keith accepted this, given he was a traitor to this workshop. He reminded Anne his father became the Silver Sugar Viscount under this very workshop. That brought a lot of vigor to this place. When his father died, they thought he would join the Page Workshop too, but he chose the Radcliffe Workshop, and thus, the rumor went around saying, the Powell family had given up on the Page Workshop. It caused artisans affiliated with this place to go to other schools all at once. But of course, Keith never gave up on the Page Workshop. He just didn't want to be affected by his father's influence. He hated the idea of being called Edward Powell's son, even after his death. He wanted to live by his own name. Anne reassured Keith it wasn't his fault the workshop ended up this way, and that everyone here understands that. It's just their feelings hadn't caught up quite yet. Keith thanked Anne for her warm words. And Anne knew if this place was rebuilt, then Keith's sense of self-condemnation and the artisan's ill feelings might all disappear. She felt determined to lead the way. 
She decided to head to Glen to ask for their workshop's participation at the selection to get the 10,000 crests and restore their reputation. However, Glen denied her request immediately. Anne questioned Master Glen's decision, but his only response to it was that his father decided this. The Page Workshop used to be the ones who created the Holy Beginnings Festival sugar confections. But then, the previous monarch decided workshops had to compete for the work. And since then, the Page Workshop was never chosen again. With the royal family and the kingdom's religion looking down on them, his father stopped their workshop from participating and Glenn personally did not want to be the one to change that. Anne continued to challenge Glenn's ways, since she was now an artisan here as well, causing Elliot to break out in laughter. He then ushered Anne out, and while the two chatted, she told Elliot that if he felt something was wrong, he should have said something as well. But he couldn't admit that to the master. Everyone here either felt a deep debt of gratitude towards Glenn, or a deep sense of admiration for him. Elliot's mother was a cook here at the main house, but when he turned seven, she fell ill and couldn't cook anymore. So, Glenn took him as an apprentice and even paid him wages. Everyone here was like Elliot in some way. Orlin then came by, and we learned he'd been here just as long as Elliot. Orlin's father was an artisan, but when he passed, Glenn took Orlin in. He was so grateful to Glenn, he even refused to cut his hair as a wish to cure Glenn of his illness. The rest of the artisans then appeared for lunch. We learned King used to be a ruffian, which Glenn had taken in to help him escape that life. Valentine was struggling to pay tuition, and Glenn took him in and gave him a wage. And Nadir was a foreigner with nowhere else to go. Back in the shop, as Anne prepared things, she now had an understanding that Glenn valued pride and history above all. Everyone here adored and followed him. She felt that was also the reason everyone's judgment here was so cloudy. She desired to see everyone's feelings link properly. However, Mithril brought up there were unfortunately things no one could do anything about. But those were the times when people put their wishes in the sugar confections. And this gave Anne a great idea. When the workers gathered, she commanded Orlin and King to continue their projects, while Valentine and Nadir would work on projects to display their skills to Anne. After everyone finished, Anne stared at the beautiful works, learning Valentine loved mathematics and Nadir loved extensive details. Glenn then showed up to the shop because despite his sickness, he still loved the sweet scent of silver sugar and also to tell them all that this year, he now believed they should participate in the selection. Anne could hardly believe it, but the stipulation being if they failed, they would never participate again and Anne would also have to leave the workshop, surrendering Xiao to Glenn permanently. With her being chosen as the new head of artisans, he wanted Anne to be held accountable for her decisions, and thus, she responded with confidence. Standing outside in the breeze, Xiao thought back to himself embracing Anne, questioning his feelings towards her. Anne then appeared to tell Xiao what's transpired, and she felt wagering his wing was necessary. Xiao was fine with it. She already told him to trust her and wait, and he was more than willing. He then touched her face, and the two stared eye to eye. And as he went for a kiss, Mithril shouted flustered because he'd been here the entire time, but he still wanted them both to continue their moment, so he was gonna leave. However, the moment was already ruined. Sitting with the artisans, Anne tried to figure out what would be an appropriate design for the Holy Beginnings Festival. Everyone began arguing on what to make, so she had to silence them. Unlike how they'd been operating, the five of them would decide what to make together. But quickly, Orlin objected to this, wondering why they had to do this. Well, Anne proposed that they could put everyone's best aspects here into a single package. Elliot showed them to a stack of journals written by previous masters of the workshop for generations. There is major difficulty in this, however, since a lot of the language has been dated. King and Nadir couldn't read it, so they had to divide the readings between Anne, Orlin, and Valentine. Valentine then suggested they ask Bridget for help, but when Anne learned no one had seen her for a while, she felt somewhat saddened. That night, Anne tried asking Bridget for help with the books. Bridget said she would only help if Xiao came back to her. Otherwise, their chat was done here. However, Anne stopped the door from closing to present Bridget a bird she had made for her. But Bridget closed the door saying she'd never accept it. And turning her back around, Anne was surprised to see Orlin was also there with a confection. Outside, Orlin said the obvious. Of course Bridget wouldn't accept Anne's confection and help out. He was here to give his own to Bridget as an apology because he was the one who stole Xiao's wing, having given it to Master Glenn. Anne was surprised to learn this, 
But it all made sense when he explained that he used to play with Bridget often when they were little. Back then, Bridget had even shown him her secret hiding spot. In her childhood days, Bridget was so excited to become a sugar artisan, and she and Orlin had become very close. In his perspective, she was a good, cheerful child. But right now, she's become the worst and watching her infuriated Orlin. Anne then understood Bridget's change was due to the path of being a sugar artisan being forbidden to her. She empathized with Bridget, who felt it was unfair a girl like Anne was allowed to become one. Orlin then explained a workshop master's child inherits their workshop if they become a sugar artisan. Being a master is hard enough work. It would be even harder for a woman. With the position their school was in, Glenn probably didn't want to put his daughter in that position that he knew was so difficult. And there it was again. Anne could clearly see each person's emotions weren't linking properly with reality. The next day at the workshop, after all the readings, they came to the conclusion that at some point, the page workshop's confection decisions began clashing with what the kingdom's religion wanted. That's why the festival selection process was created. So, Anne's answer to this was they should all make something together that would help Glenn. And the four boys were surprised to hear this. They would all work better with someone they cared for in mind. They were already working to make Glenn proud and happy. So that's the kind of piece they should make for the selection. The four boys then concluded it should be a snowy theme, since it was a motif Glenn favored. But suddenly, they heard the shouting of Hal calling for help, and spotted Elliot bloodied and injured. After getting his wounds tended by a doctor, Elliot woke up, happy to see Bridget came to tend to his wounds. But upon being spotted, she ran away. Shao then questioned who attacked Elliot, and he explained that someone in a hood suddenly showed up, saying they could smell the silver sugar on him. That's when the assailant started slashing at him. Shao then drew his blade, questioning if the attacker used something similar. Elliot described the shine to be similar, but more reddish with a silver light. That's when Shao knew, 100% it was a fairy that attacked Elliot. Anne was flabbergasted that someone would send a warrior fairy to attack, but no one knew the motive. Elliot just felt blessed he was still alive, but he needed Anne and Orlin to continue working. He didn't want to be an excuse for letting Glenn's resolve down by producing a disgraceful result for the selection. So, with the work about to begin, Anne showed everyone a sketch reference of snowflakes they could make, and each of the artisans designed flakes in their own style. On the ninth day, they piled the crystals together, and seeing it, Elliot's eyes widened at the sight of the beautiful snow tower. Even Glenn showed up. He was overjoyed. He wanted to see the church lined up with rows of these inside. He then praised Anne for doing a good work as their head of artisans. He put her in charge of presenting the tree to the church, and commanded Shao to guard her on the way there. Heading towards St. Lewiston Bell Church, the sun was beginning to set. Shao planned for them to continue traveling even during nightfall because he knew the silver sugar of the tree would certainly attract the fairy assailant. He wanted them to get to the safety of the town as soon as possible. Under the light of the moon, the horses suddenly got scared, and a hooded fairy with red hair appeared, the very one that had attacked Elliot. Shao jumped in front of the sneering fairy to give Anne and the crew a chance to escape. He then began his fight clashing his blade against the deadly red threads of the attacker. The assailant commented, Obsidian, is it? I haven't seen a fellow precious stone in a while. I don't want a fight. I will save you. He then asked who held Shao's wing, but Shao ignored this, questioning the fairy's identity and who sent him. The fairy responded he held his own wings. He was free, but felt being alone was occasionally inconvenient. He wanted Shao as his ally, so he decided he'd chase down the carriage kill everyone, steal the sugar confection, and capture their silver sugar master. Shao refused to let this slide though, and slashed. However, the assailant easily dodged, and the two continued their fight. With the sun rising, the team made it to Lewiston, where upon arriving, Master Radcliffe was shocked his school would be competing with theirs. The church members began speaking in hushed whispers. No one was expecting the page workshop to be competing this year. Radcliffe's school presented their piece first, with the master scoffing at Anne as he presented a golden knight, clearly inspired by Shao under Keith's direction. It was a depiction of the founding king. Mercury School went next, creating a piece that represented the twelve patron saints. Then, when Anne presented the page workshops, explaining the snow of the Holy Beginnings Festival cleansed hearts in a solemn way, no one was excited because of its dim look. Something was wrong here. Why wouldn't it shine like back at the shop? However, when Shao arrived, Opening the door and letting the sunlight in, showing the shine that came from his injury, Anne had her answer. 
The piece needed light. They had the church light up the room, and everyone was blown back by the brilliant shine of the snow tower. The shine represented snowfall, and its prayer would be good fortune upon the kingdom in the new year. The decision from the church was unanimous. They wanted the pieces crafted by the Page School, bringing a smile on Anne's and everyone else from the school's face. Afterwards, Elliot handed Anne Shao's wing, something they had planned to give her if they had won. Sitting by himself, Shao could smell the beloved scent of silver sugar. He slowly opened his eyes to see Anne and Mithril before him, and then panicked seeing his wound. The assailant unfortunately got away, but Shao swore he'd kill him the next time they met. Anne then explained she wanted to continue to work for the Page Workshop to complete the work for the Holy Beginnings Festival. Even having accomplished her goal in saving Shao, she still wanted to help rebuild the workshop. She then handed Shao his wing back and he stood smiling at her. He touched her face, acknowledging her for saving him and being a Silver Sugar Master through her own strength. He wanted her to hold her head up high. With his eyes glimmering, he gave her a light kiss on the head and wished her to have many blessings to come. The page workshop arrived at where they'd be working for the next two months to produce pieces for the church. However, Anne was a little nervous given the look of the rundown castle they'd be staying at. Shao calmly stated it was haunted, freaking Anne out a little. With the arrival of Glenn, he knew this place as Holy Leaf Castle. Most people don't know, but 15 years ago, the royal family of Millsland faced an insurrection started by a branch family, House Chamber commonly referred to as the Chamber's Rebellion. The battle ended in House Millsland's victory. House Chamber and their followers were all slain. This very house was owned by the Chamber family. Anne really questioned why the church didn't tell them where they'd be staying, giving Nadir and Mithril the opportunity to scare her with ghost talk again. Inside, the place was run down, exactly like how it looked on the outside. Observing many of the portraits, Shao could tell it wasn't just the faces that had been removed but also the crests of House Chamber. To House Milsen, the crest of Chamber would have been declared a taboo. They must have wanted to eradicate every trace of it. Setting her suitcase down in her room, coughing from the dust, Anne then opened the curtains and told herself there couldn't possibly be ghosts here. But while going through her things, she suddenly heard an echoed voice say, Young Miss Silver Sugar Master. However, the room was empty, so she tried to quell her fears by saying she was just imagining things. The voice then said, I'm glad you're here, making her jolt, but still, no one was around. She then ran into Shao, telling him there was a ghost, explaining what happened to her, but he just reassured her she was just hearing things. She then began frantically blathering that she'd been cursed by House Chamber, wondering what she should do, so Shao closed in on her ear to ask if kissing her would help. She was so taken aback, she recovered back to her senses. But after Anne went off, Shao noticed light steps pass by and disappear. Now why would a ghost leave footprints? At night, Anne wanted Mithril to sleep in her room. She felt apprehensive because of her ghostly interactions. Mithril didn't mind, but he felt like Shao would be a better fit for this kind of thing. This made her screech a little. She was too embarrassed for something like that. Mithril thought she was being stupid, so he decided to go ask Shao for her. But she grabbed on to prevent him. Perfect timing though, because Shao wanted to know what all the ruckus was about. Anne slyly told him nothing was wrong covering Mithril's mouth. However, Shao was more concerned about whether or not the two of them had seen something violet-colored. Mithril knew something was here. Shao then warned the two to be careful before he left. The next morning at breakfast, both Anne and Orlin were a little tired. Orlin had an issue with the lock on his door. No matter how many times he locked it, it would always unlock for some reason. It seemed everyone else's room was the same way. Anne's issue was she heard doors opening and closing all through the night and couldn't sleep. Mithril then reported there was a violet-covered ghost and he was on the case. However, Shao told him not to alter what he said. He never said it was a ghost. The team then began discussing their workflow for producing more snow towers for the Holy Festival, and that's when Hugh and Selim suddenly appeared. Every year, the Choice Workshop must undergo inspection from the Silver Sugar Viscount to ascertain the progress of the pieces and how good or poor the workmanship is. Should they fail inspection? Mercury Workshop will take their place and have their pieces displayed instead. And of course, they'd take the 10,000 crests as compensation as well. After Hugh left, the team got to work, crafting snowflake after snowflake as a team. In the evening, Bridget's carriage arrived with her new green-haired companion fairy she purchased. 
and Anne was stunned by his beauty. Gladys introduced himself, pleased to make everyone's acquaintance. Elliot questioned why she bought a new one, given everything that happened with Xiao. Bridget's reasoning was that her father took Xiao's wing because she restrained him too tightly. This time, she allowed her fairy his freedom. Elliot then asked if she was doing this despite her father, making her offended. She had every intention of telling him of her decision, and Elliot decided to go with her. Mithril could tell Gladys was a precious stone, just like Xiao, and hearing Xiao's name, Gladys suddenly stopped to look at him, but then continued on. Anne questioned if Xiao knew this fairy, but he didn't. Mithril was also somewhat confused, since he could tell Gladys was from a precious stone, but he couldn't tell what kind. He's usually good at picking out what objects fairies are born from, so Xiao answered it would probably be opal, since the stone possesses many colors depending on the refraction of the light. Ambiguity is a defining trait. That night, Anne spotted Bridget outside, thinking she was a ghost and freaked out. Bridget was just thinking about how her father scolded her earlier for purchasing a new fairy as a way of getting attention. He wanted her to return Gladys immediately. At this moment, Bridget acknowledged her father was probably right. Anne then came to offer her a scarf, because it was chilly outside. Bridget tried to deny it, saying she was cold, but Anne ran away before she could give it back. Staring out into the night sky, Xiao quickly turned around drawing his blade at the neck of Gladys. Xiao was wary with there being something of unknown nature wandering the castle. Gladys wanted to take in the fresh air up here as well, making small talk with Xiao. He thought it was surprising Xiao didn't have a human name. He asked who Xiao's master was, but of course, no one controlled him. Xiao had his own questions for Gladys, however. Given he's also a precious stone, he should have the ability to create sharp objects. He should be a warrior fairy, so why was he purchased as a companion one? Gladys then revealed he's unable to fight, given he could only produce a small nail-like object. Gladys desired to be friends with Xiao, since he felt they were similar. However, Xiao had no interest. The next day, Mithril was excited to do some ghost hunting, despite Xiao wanting no part in his tomfoolery. However, Mithril declared it to be of utmost importance, given the ghost was a huge distraction to everyone's work. Gladys found this interesting and decided to be included in this endeavor. However, the sight of him prompted Xiao to leave and return to his room. After another day of work, Anne returned to her room, hesitant to even open the door knowing she'd be alone because Mithril was out ghost hunting. When she had just lied down, Xiao suddenly opened the door to tell her something was beside her, and she screamed, while Xiao took this opportunity to pin the fairy down. This was their ghost, who just lost consciousness. With the fairy, Noah, resting up, Xiao surmised he had the ability to turn invisible and walk through walls. Noah then woke up, a little frightened, covering himself, but then got up to call them all thieves, declaring this house belonged to House Chamber, and he was Lord Herbert's page, sworn to protect this castle on behalf of his master. Mithril then stated that House Chamber was rooted 15 years ago, and everyone had most likely died, but Noah swatted him and denied this. No matter how much time would pass, Noah would wait for his master to return. Xiao then figured some time after the master of this castle left, soldiers from the Millsen royal family came here. Noah didn't like the idea of the words of some fairy being controlled by a thief. However, Xiao presented his wing that he owned. He was here with Anne because he chose to be. Noah then admitted knights trooped through the castle, having ripped out every crest and shredded every portrait. They took every bit of furniture with the crest carved into it and burned it all in the garden. He understood House Chamber had lost, but even so, to Noah, this was still his lord's castle, and rambling on about how he would continue to wait for his master, he fell from not having eaten in a long time. The next day, Anne kept thinking about how Noah refused to eat anything other than what his lord had given him. It apparently was an order from Lord Herbert. Anne couldn't help but think that such an order was cruel. Gladys then passed by, greeting her good morning. He then touched her face, making her jolt away as he remarked she had such a lovely aroma. And even though all the artists here smelled of silver sugar, he thought her smell was truly sublime as he sniffed her hair. Anne then quickly found an excuse to run from this weird interaction, and looking from above, Xiao gave the nastiest death glare to Gladys. As Gladys passed by, he mentioned a dark chapel with a hole dug through one wall, and an altar at the very back. It had ornaments decorating the entrance, but all that was left on the ceiling and walls are scars, evidence of excavation. Xiao wondered how he could possibly know about that place. Who was Gladys really? That night, 
and spotted Noah staring at what was left of the portrait of his master. It was the only one clean, probably because of him, and then questioned why Noah remained here, despite being in possession of his wing. To which he responded his mission as Lord Herbert's page was to protect the castle and await his return, and questioned the authenticity of an order like, protect this castle, don't leave, don't eat anything I haven't given you. Noah then revealed Herbert wouldn't take him to the battlefield, and that he could leave once he ate all the sugar confections his lord had given him, and then realized Lord Herbert was probably a kind man who wanted Noah to run away. However, Noah ate all the confections, save for one piece. That way he wouldn't have to leave the castle yet, and then offered Noah a confection to eat, but Noah refused, knowing if he ate it, he'd have to leave. Staring out the window, Shao was fixated on why Gladys knew about the place only he and Liz should know about. He then opened his door to find Anne carrying a passed out Noah on her back. They laid Noah down and when Anne explained his situation to Shao, it brought her to tears. Shao then told her since she's a silver sugar master, she just needed to make something that would convince Noah to eat. And this cheered her up because he was right. Shao then put on a serious look, pulling Anne close to ask if Gladys said anything to her. She was a little nervous, explaining all he said was that she smelt like silver sugar. Shao sighed, and then gave her a kiss on the cheek, pissed that Gladys would touch this woman he cared for. He then began kissing her more, telling her she was too defenseless. He wanted her to stay on guard in case Gladys was dangerous. He then kissed her again, and since she didn't sleep well last night, he wanted her to sleep in his room, and she nodded at his command. And then went downstairs to rest her head on the table. She felt Xiao was treating her just like a child, but she was so happy. She rested her eyes and hearing the echoed voice of the man that called her young Miss Silver Sugar Master earlier, she realized it was Lord Herbert, who she had a vision of playing chess with Noah. He often gave Noah confections with the house chamber crest imbued within. The crest was the pride of the chamber family. The swords, shield, and lion are strength. The blue flag is compassion. It says, follow me for I bestow compassion on the people with my strength. Although, Herbert didn't know much about wielding a sword. Still, the two had such a lovely relationship. The tale was destined for sadness, however, with Noah in tears being left behind against their battle with Milsland. This was where Herbert gave Noah the bag of confections. He then told Noah when he got hungry and ran out, he should leave this place. Noah questioned why, but received no answer. And awakening from her dream, the ghost of Herbert's voice prayed for Anne to save Noah, and then peered outside, seeing the intense rain. The rest of the artisans then began panicking, because checking their barrels, all the silver sugar was hardened from the cold water leaking through the roof. Things were looking dire with all of the sugar unusable. There's no way they'd finish in time for the festival. Elliot told Anne not to cry and be rational. So with some focus, Anne called for everyone to gather the silver sugar to the hearth room to drive out the moisture. Hugh then arrived at the scene, and it was even worse than he thought it was. He knew the castle was damaged and suspected this would happen. He offered to have more sugar sent from his school or Radcliffe's, but Elliot refused. The page workshop was determined to regrind the sugar by themselves. That night, Anne and Elliot lamented a bit over their current situation. Despite what Elliot had said to Hugh, he wasn't confident that they'd actually succeed on their own. But maybe if they had one more artisan, and thinking about someone who wasn't affiliated with any school, Cat came to mind. Everyone wished Godspeed to Anne and Shao, who went off to convince Cat to help them. Bridget just sighed, watching from afar with a bit of longing. So Gladys came in to hold her, consoling her, saying everyone was so cold to her despite the fact that she's worried about them too. She's always been this way. Arriving at Cat's new shop, the business seems to be terrible for him as per usual. Anne kindly woke up Benjamin, who called out to Cat, and he was happy to see Anne had gotten Xiao back. She then began explaining the situation with the silver sugar, and Cat had quickly figured out what had happened, since he was familiar with Hollyleaf Castle. He also perceived she had come here for his help making confections for the festival. However, he refused, since his MO was only to make things he wanted to make. Xiao then began calmly calling Cat names, pissing him off, but more importantly, Xiao brought up the fact that Cat owed Hugh a favor since he'd lost their bet. So Anne promised to make Hugh give up the favor in return for having Cat help them with their confections. Cat was sweating over what he should do, but decided helping Anne would be much better than having to do what Hugh requests of him. So he agreed. Back at the castle, Anne requested Hugh give up the favor, 
but he refused. He knows Cat only makes things whenever he wants. So with this favor over Cat's head, he felt pretty powerful right now. So, with Xiao's touch imbuing Anne with confidence, she challenged Hugh to a confectionery competition. Hearing this got Hugh fired up. He's heard there's a fairy here who is suffering because he isn't eating. So whoever manages to feed that fairy wins. Later, after discovering Anne would be competing against Hugh, Mithril spazzed out feeling Anne had no chance of winning. Anne then went into where everyone was grinding down the sugar. They were working so hard, the deer had blisters and torn skin. But still, they trusted Anne to do what she needed to defeat Hugh. They would just do extra work in her stead. Looking at Noah resting, Xiao thought it was still possible Noah would eat neither of the confections. Anne then asked Xiao if all sugar confections held a lot of allure to them. Xiao then explained when the shape holds meaning to a fairy, the more beautiful it is, the sweeter it smells. The urge to draw it into oneself, it's a lot like the desire to kiss someone who is dear to you. Anne wondered if Noah had anyone or anything like that besides Lord Herbert. Xiao then got up to tell Anne to go to bed so she could rest for the competition. However, she didn't want Xiao to be the only one up all night watching over Noah. In response, Xiao held her hand, asking if she required another goodnight kiss. He'd do it if necessary. The last time he did that flashed into Anne's mind, and she quickly ran out to head to bed. The next day, Anne kept thinking about what to make for Noah. It needed to be something that held meaning for him. She thought about making something in Lord Herbert's likeness, but she didn't exactly have the best visual reference of him. Looking at his portrait, Gladys appeared, but every step he made forward caused Anne to step back because of Xiao's warning. Gladys assured her there was nothing to fear, and even claimed he was close to Xiao in a way Xiao couldn't understand yet. He had no ill intent towards him. Bridget then burst into the room, asking what was going on, and Gladys responded he was simply asking Anne about her competition with the Viscount. Bridget couldn't believe Anne would even think of competing against Hugh, but she quickly pulled Gladys away. As Anne continued to contemplate while staring at the portrait, Xiao asked if she'd come up with anything, but still, nothing so far. She felt bad for how much Noah's been hurt, and how it must be so painful to keep looking at the portrait even though his lord is gone. Xiao suspected there's something here only Noah could see. This made a lot of sense. If all he wanted was to remember the past, there'd be no need to come stare at this portrait specifically. That's when Anne finally figured it out. She asked Xiao to take down the portrait, and behind it was the last remaining crest of House Chamber. A crest is the pride of a noble house, and this was the only one left. It was Lord Herbert's heart in physical form. This is what Noah had really been looking at. And now, this is what Anne was going to make, despite the fact that it would definitely be taboo to the kingdom's royalty. However, Xiao promised to protect her, no matter who would come her way. As Anne began working on the confection, Mithril freaked out learning she was making the taboo crest, but seeing how serious she was, he decided to help out. After completing her work, she and Hugh decided to present their pieces to Noah. Noah was blown away at the sight of Hugh's piece. It was a copy of the chessboard that he and his lord had played with 15 years ago in confectionery form. Noah reached out to the board, clutching with his master in his heart. However, he did not consume a single piece. Anne then presented several pieces of the crest of House Chamber, lighting Noah up, and he consumed one immediately. With the confectionery being absorbed into the light, it was like the spirit of his master was right in front of him. Noah began tearing up, not meaning to consume the treat, but his body compelled him. Hugh then handed him another one of the crests, assuring him Lord Herbert wouldn't be angry. Noah then cried over it, reminiscing the fun times he had with his master. With the sun setting, Hugh scolded Anne because recreating that crest would be seen as rebelling against the crown. Anne knew, but to not make something that someone needed, she felt there'd be no point to being a silver sugar master like that. Hugh shuddered at her words, but accepted that this was her victory. He had also made crests for House Chamber before, but since serving the crown, he destroyed them all. As the silver sugar viscount, he was only allowed to make confectionaries for their royalty. Anne then questioned why he became the Viscount. He responded that Cat had asked him the same thing. He asked, Do you want power so badly that you throw away your freedom? Cat was angry about it, but he was also right. Hugh was willing to sacrifice his freedom for the power he now held, because without it, there were things that just weren't possible. 
Bridget was relieved to overhear Orland and Nadir mention how Anne won. She then went to her room and spotted Gladys with a confectionery chessboard. He'd stolen it from Noah. Bridget commanded him to stop consuming it, since it wasn't meant for him, but he completely ignored her, instantly dashing right in front of Bridget, telling her to quiet down. He threw her aside, and consuming more of the confection, he felt power welling inside of him. He was injured and had been searching for the power to restore himself. He used Bridget, and didn't have even the slightest speck of guilt. To retaliate, she pulled out his wing and squeezed it, but was shocked to find out it wasn't his wing at all, and she was causing a completely different fairy to suffer. Later, Gladys appeared before Xiao, and of course, Xiao was not happy to see him. However, ever since Gladys had heard Xiao's name, he knew Xiao was one of the ones he'd been searching for. Through what Gladys called a sequence of unfortunate coincidences, the two were torn from each other. After 100 years had passed, Gladys had even given up, but now revealed his true name, Lafal Fen Lafal, and Xiao was shocked to hear it was similar to his own name. It's a name he knew in his soul before he was even born, as the obsidian he was born from was embedded in the hilt of a sword forgotten to time. Lafal then explained there should have been an opal and a diamond embedded right next to that very obsidian. Lafal was that opal, and those three precious stones were chosen specifically with the hope that something would be born from them. Xiao demanded to know who the sword belonged to. However, Lafal refrained from answering for now. He would tell Xiao only if Xiao came along with him. However, with Anne in Xiao's mind, he had no intention of going anywhere with Lafal. Lafal figured she'd be his motivation. So, all he had to do was simply take her as well. Hearing this, Xiao quickly drew his blade, but Lafal responded by summoning his weapon, the Red Threads. He had suffered quite the injury from their last duel, but thanks to the Viscount's confection, he's completely recovered. Before discovering who Xiao was, Lafal had intended to tear him to shreds, but now he was at a disadvantage in this fight because he wanted to bring Xiao back with him. So his aim has become to capture Anne. Xiao wasn't going to stand for that and began his assault, but Lafal fended him off, shredding the forest apart and making his escape. Xiao then rushed to find Anne, who had just woken up napping next to Noah. He held her close, telling her he wouldn't hand her over, because he swore he'd always stay by her side and protect her, only adding to her confusion on what was happening. However, stepping outside, Orland came face to face with Lafal, and his blood-curdling scream brought everyone outside. Anne stared in horror at the sight of Orland's bloodied face. As they began to treat him, Xiao explained the Red Fairy they met on the highway had been with them the entire time. They were all in shock to discover it was Gladys. Bridget was distraught, seeing this was all her fault. She ran away, so Anne and Xiao ran after her. She was also being put in a tough position. Considering the page workshop was down another man. In addition, he had to report the Red Fairy's attacks to the Earl of Downing. That way they could deploy troops to chase after Lafal. Walking on their way to Bridget, Xiao explained Lafal's intention to capture Anne as a way to control him. Anne was shaken, hearing her life was being threatened. So Xiao held her close, telling her not to leave his side. Anne knocked at Bridget's door, and Bridget immediately answered she was the reason Orlin was suffering. However, Anne shifted blame off of her saying everyone here was fooled. This made Bridget step out in tears, frustrated by the fact that she wasn't even allowed to blame herself. She didn't know what to do, so Anne calmed her, telling Bridget they just needed to think. The artisans continued to work, despite Anne still fearing for her life. She decided to focus on what she could do right now, since Xiao promised to protect her. The next morning, Kat arrived, and Anne rushed down to greet him. She then went to Master Glenn to tell him the news. He was relieved to hear Alf Hingley would be assisting them, but still disappointed that his daughter's foolish actions caused Orland to lose one of his eyes. He was still exhausted and didn't want to deal with her yet. Outside his room, Anne sighed. Still knowing Glenn's relationship with his daughter was rocky, Shao commented that she treated people too well, when, right now, she needed to worry about herself more. Elliot then called out to Anne. He needed her to accompany him at the request of the kingdom's religion. The head of the church was informed of their progress from Hugh. They had to regrind their hardened sugar, one of their artisans had been injured, peace, and not a single piece had been finished. With a month and a half left, he had no confidence in their workshop finishing in time, and proposed the Mercury Workshop step in on their behalf. 
He understood they suffered from unlucky circumstances and offered to still reward them with 10,000 crests because of it. However, Anne grabbed at her dress, knowing her pride was being damaged here. Elliot was eager to accept. However, Anne didn't want that. If they gave up their work now, they'd be selling the pride of their artisans as well. But Elliot was just goading her to speak her true feelings as their head of artisans. They told the priests they had every intention to complete their pieces for the Holy Beginnings Festival. Riding away after their declarations, Anne spotted a familiar character lying against the wall. She jumped out of the cart to approach Kathy and Jonas, who certainly seen better days. In her room, Bridget stared at the confectionaries Orland and Anne had gifted her. She then went to check on Orland. Even though she was concerned about him, he was fine, calmly stating he still had one eye and his fingers were intact too. But most importantly, he's glad she's safe. Bridget broke down, apologizing to Orland over and over. She then asked if she could tend to him, which was a shock enough to make him audibly gasp. However, she admitted she knows that these days, she's been selfish, arrogant, and intolerable. Regardless, he accepted her help, and when she reached for his hand, he grabbed hers. Anne tried shaking Jonas awake, who was a complete mess, drinking all the time since he was kicked out of the Radcliffe workshop. Seeing Anne, he jolted and pathetically started crawling away. However, she pulled him back, not letting Jonas escape. She explained that everything Sammy did at the exhibition was brought to light, and Jonas's innocence was proven. It was news to Jonas that Master Radcliffe wanted to apologize to him and welcome him back to the workshop. But Jonas didn't want to go back. Keith was there. Jonas didn't want to be compared to the artisan who was clearly better than him. Anne then invited him to the page workshop, but he declined because he was done with silver sugar. He'd rather drink, so he lashed out at her. He felt someone who could make confections as well as she could, could never understand his pain. But he cried, admitting he truly did want to continue improving. They ended up recruiting him, but seeing Kat there, Jonas tried escaping. However, Anne wouldn't let him. After Anne briefed the team a little about who Jonas was, they accepted him with open arms. As Jonas marveled at the sight of the snow tower, Xiao sensed something and ran off. At the entrance, the red threads wrapped around Elliot's neck. Lafal was right behind holding the strings. With Elliot's life being threatened, he admitted Lafal would release him if they handed Anne over. And in a split second, the threads shot at Anne, but Xiao quickly slashed them apart. However, it was no use with the second set wrapped around Anne. She walked forward to protect Elliot, who was released after some bleeding. Xiao was then commanded to come next, and watching Lafal smell Anne's hair again, Xiao got pissed. He then handed over his wing, and Lafal squeezed it, harming Xiao but ensuring the authenticity of what was in the baggie. Lafal then told Xiao to get on the other horse, and the three rode away. They arrived in a land covered in snow, approaching Lafal's base of operations. Lafal released Anne at Xiao's request, even though he'd like to torture her more, and shoved her into Xiao. She was freezing, so they headed inside where she was put by a fire and covered with a blanket. Anne thanked Xiao for warming her but had so many concerns. Was everyone else alright? What about the sugar confections? And Xiao's wing was taken again. Xiao just told her not to worry. She must be tired. He wanted her to rest and sleep, not think any further. As Anne slept, Xiao stared at her neck still frustrated at Lafal's actions towards it earlier. He then went for a kiss himself, and that's when Lafal appeared behind him. Lafal found the flames of fire to be beautiful. When he had first seen humans burn things in their houses, at first, he thought it was for decoration. When he learned it was a necessity to live in cold environments, he was surprised. He thought of humans as weak, barbaric creatures, unsightly animals with no wisdom or strength. The humans admired the fairies so much, they even began taking on fairy-like forms and began to grow in intelligence. He felt fairies were much superior. Xiao simply told him to get out, but Lafal responded by saying he prepared a much better, separate room from Anne for him. He felt Xiao should be treated as an equal, which Xiao didn't take kindly to considering Lafal still held his wing. Xiao questioned who the other fairies inside were, so Lafal led him around, explaining the previous fairy king tried to understand humans, but the human king Cedric warred with the Fairy King. Lafal felt the fact that they fought was proof humans and fairies were incompatible. The Fairy King, Reselva Cyril Sash, was the one who gave all fairies life, and he's the owner of the sword that held their precious stones. Opal, Obsidian, Diamond, Reselva had hoped one of those stones would become the next Fairy King, 
something Xiao was surprised to hear. But he thought Le Fall was being ridiculous. The sword was guarded by humans. No one wanted the return of the Fairy King. Le Fall rebuttaled, correcting Xiao because no human wants a new Fairy King. The fact that he was born from the gaze of a moon eagle and Xiao was born from a young girl, Le Fall felt this was destiny created by the Fairy King. In his hand, he held the diamond from the sword, with there still being no sign of their kin being born from it. But regardless, he felt with their combined powers, they could free all the fairies and carry on Reselva's will to reclaim the kingdom. Xiao only had Anne in mind. He refused. Even if that is what Reselva wanted, he had no interest in the fairy king. This angered Lafal, knowing that girl had stolen the heart of his brethren. The two drew their weapons at each other, and now clearly understanding Xiao's resolve, Lafal took it upon himself to alone become the fairy king. He then taunted Xiao, because no matter how attached he was to Anne, he knew her life would run out far before Xiao's would. They wouldn't be able to even have a child to continue their legacy. He then walked past Xiao, as he told him he'd only bring Anne sorrow. After Keith received the notice from Hugh about everything that had been going on at the page workshop, he rushed on horseback to Leaf Holly Castle. He demanded to know why everyone was still working instead of helping to find Anne. This pissed Elliot off, because if they could do something for her, they would. But logically, if Xiao had trouble fighting the Red Fairy, what chance did they stand? As sugar artisans, they were doing what they could. If they hadn't made any progress when Anne returned, she'd probably be disappointed in them. The rest of the team calmed Elliot down, making him release Keith. Then Keith apologized as well. He came here because he was worried about Anne, but also because he respected the page workshop as the place where his father worked. He felt so foolish and short-sighted, and decided to ask if they'd let him help as well. So they accepted him in. Elsewhere though, Rafal was handling some dirty work. He came into Anne's room and she stared in shock being presented a bloodied barrel of silver sugar. He needed her to make confections so he could restore his strength. Anne questioned how he obtained the barrel, knowing everyone had to work hard this year to refine the sugar because of the poor harvest. But learning of the horrific deeds, Anne didn't want her hands touching that sugar. So, he reasoned that if she was useless, he'd kill her and bring in another artisan from her workshop. And that was enough to make her reluctantly agree. Anne then wanted to know where Xiao was, but became terrified further to discover Rafal had been tasking Xiao with disposing of anything that stood in their way. He then told Anne that if she loved Xiao, she should leave him, because when she'd eventually die, he'd be left alone all over again. Humans should be with humans, fairies with fairies. He felt that's where happiness lied. Staying with Xiao and leaving him suffering down the line would only bring him sorrow. Lafal's words affected Anne. She ran out of the room, searching for Xiao desperately. She found an open door, and inside were other fairies. One in particular being Lucelle Elmine, the fairy she gave life to. Anne was surprised to see one of her wings missing. Had she been captured by a human at some point? Lucelle smiled earnestly, replying she had it removed and offered it to Master Lafal. She couldn't do it herself since it hurt so much. So Lafal did it for her. Not just her, everyone here. They'd all given one of their wings to him as proof of their loyalty. Anne questioned why they would pledge loyalty to him, and Lucelle responded it was because he's their king. He promised to give all fairies freedom. Anne then cried, thinking what she heard was so cruel. They were being controlled and lied to, promising them all freedom but making them give up their wings? That was no different from what humans did. Lucelle didn't understand why Anne was sad. So Anne added she was furious. There was no need for them to give up their wings. No king in the world had the right to take something that beautiful from all of them. Xiao then appeared behind her, soaked, having washed all the blood off of himself. He asked the rest of the fairies if anyone understood the root of Anne's anger. And when no one did, Lucelle asked Xiao to explain why. He told them Anne gave his wing back, while Lafal stole his wing from him. He wanted them to all think about what that meant. Anne stood with Xiao, unsure what to do next, as Lafal smirked, knowing everything was going as planned. Robbing another artisan of their silver sugar, Lafal commanded Xiao to kill the man. Xiao refused, so another fairy took on the job. With the stolen sugar loaded into the cart, Xiao stabbed a hole in one of the barrels to leave a trail. Lafal smashed a piece Anne had made because it was poor quality. With Lafal threatening to rob another artisan, she pleaded for another chance to craft the piece again. But for some reason, the motivation wasn't there. 
Who sell then appeared, and the two chatted about the state of things in the castle. Hussell explained the other fairies didn't speak much of their reasons for being here, but when they did, they said it was better than being controlled by humans. She then spotted the silver sugar and wondered why it was here. Turns out, Hussell had never even eaten a confection before, so Anne decided to make one for her. She produced the same beautiful herb berries Lucelle was born from, and when Lucelle ate it, she felt the sweetness energize her. She wanted to bring this to share with some of the other fairies, especially the injured ones. Anne happily obliged, allowing Lucelle to scurry off with the confection. Xiao then came in next, to rest after his long day. Anne decided to sit by the fire, unable to ask what Xiao is being forced to do. Even if she learned what it was, there's nothing she could do about it anyway. Rafal's words telling her to let go of Xiao then ran through her mind. So she asked Xiao if he had ever met a female precious stone fairy. He wondered what this was all about, and Anne wondered if there might be someone he'd fall in love with. She was happy when Xiao said he'd stay with her forever, but now, she doubted if it was right to indulge herself in those words. She didn't want Xiao to push himself too hard. She wanted him to be happy. Xiao then closed in on her, reminding her it was okay to rely on him. He tried to comfort her by being face to face, but Rafal's words only pushed Anne back. The next day, there were tons of injured fairies in the castle, so Anne came by, bringing more confections to help them recover. With the fairies taking it, Lucelle was super happy. Anne then thought back to when she had rescued Mithril from captivity, and how he said he'd never thank a human. She just wanted to go home and return to what she needed to do. Anne felt sorry for these fairies, because without their wings, they couldn't go where they wanted to go, or do what they wanted to do. However, none of them had any ambitions to be anywhere else really, until one fairy brought up wanting to see the ocean. Lucelle had never seen it before, and it scared her. Anne wished she could get everyone their wings back and give them all freedom. But one of the fairies objected, thinking this was freedom, since they weren't being controlled by humans. However, Anne denied this. They weren't free, they just had one master changed out for another. Back at the Hollyleaf Castle, with only 20 days left until the festival, Keith asked Jonas if he thought Anne was going to come back. Jonas was confident she would, since Anne was headstrong and persistent. He believed she'd be fine. We then moved to the place LaFall had last robbed, where Hugh spotted the trail of silver sugar spilt on the floor. They now had their lead to rescue Anne and Xiao. At a camp, where Rafal's crew was on a mission to liberate some fairies, one of the members asked Xiao to ask Anne to make more confections for them today. Xiao had been wondering who she'd been making them for. Rafal declared that their time of gathering allies was over for now, because tomorrow, they'd attack the town. The number of fairies they recruited was so high now, that the fortress was too small. He wanted to make this their territory, so he'd start their kingdom takeover here, then begin freeing the fairies everywhere. Xiao questioned if Rafal was saying how he truly felt. Seeing Rafal's back, where one wing was missing, he now figured this wasn't a mission to liberate the fairies, but instead to get back at the humans who had enslaved him at one point. Xiao then questioned why since Rafal was born before him, did he not make a move in the last 100 years? This pissed Rafal off, but Xiao kept going. Unlike himself, Rafal knew he'd been chosen to become Fairy King, so having been captured by humans and controlled in spite of that must have been agony. Rafal tried to silence Xiao, threatening him with the wing he held. So Xiao quickly added the reason Rafal kept hold of the wings of the fairies he's gathered is because he trusts no one. Xiao even surmised the reason Rafal made fairies who had two wings give up one was because he was infuriated by the fact he only had one wing. The truth of Xiao's words made Rafal frown. Rafal didn't just hate humans, he hated his fellow fairies too. Xiao believed Rafal had also been betrayed by fairies as well, the reason why he ended up enslaved to humans in the first place. This truly struck a nerve with Rafal. He justified hating and attacking humans would lead to freedom for all fairies. He felt his fellow fairies lived aimless lives, and justified controlling them so they wouldn't do stupid things. He questioned what was wrong with the fact that he might also enjoy revenge and control if it led to the correct outcome. Xiao then challenged this, telling Rafal revenge and control are not things the fairy king should enjoy. Back at the fortress, Anne presented more confectionaries and the fairies were pleased to take them. However, one of them asked why a human like her was helping them out. Beginning her explanation, Rafal grabbed her shoulder questioning why she only made him trash while everyone else got to enjoy beautiful confections. Anne tried her best to explain that every time she tried for him, it just didn't work for some reason. 
Rafal laughed maniacally, understanding Anne rejected him from the bottom of her heart. So he began dragging Anne away. He tossed Anne on the floor in a room, angry with her still for stealing Xiao's heart. He believed that if she never existed, Xiao would have been by his side fighting along with him. Anne told Rafal even if they never had met, Xiao would still be the same. If he wanted a chance to be friends with Xiao, he should just give everyone's wing back. However, Rafal just yelled at her, telling her she was just a lowly human. Xiao checked Anne's room, but of course she wasn't there. He then asked the three fairies who last saw her what happened. And when Lucelle explained Anne was taken, one of the other fairies tried to stop her out of fear she'd be killed by Rafal. Xiao questioned if this fairy was content being Rafal's pet, checking his moods, following his orders. Again, this was the same as being controlled by humans. Xiao had no intention of being a pet. He wanted to protect what was important with his own hands. Anne questioned what Xiao had to do with the Fairy King. As Rafal wrapped his threads around her neck, he planned to kill her now, thinking one day, hundreds of years from now, he could change Xiao's perspective. But Xiao came in the nick of time, slicing the thread apart. The two spoke back and forth of their different ideologies. Xiao felt the Fairy King had no need to free the fairies. He'd find a different path than the one Rafal was on. However, Rafal didn't want to wait that long. Their pride would be crushed long before Xiao's way could ever come to fruition. So, he pulled out Xiao's wing and crushed it, forcing him to fall. Xiao then told Anne to leave, and she rushed out. But it was clear Rafal had the upper hand. Anne came running out, begging the other three fairies to save Xiao, only for one of them to grab her arm. Xiao was still writhing in pain as Rafal squeezed the wing out of indignation for Xiao insulting him and defending a human. Rafal thought they could have been on the same side. They could have been kings together, but blamed Xiao's love for a human girl to be his downfall. Then, oh no, two of the fairies presented Anne because they captured her. This pleased Rafal very much, so he smugly bent down telling Xiao to watch. He pulled Anne's face close, giving Lucelle the opportunity to jump out and return the wing to Xiao. Now Rafal was more pissed. His fellow brethren had betrayed him once again. The fairies begged him to let Anne go, and before Rafal had the opportunity to discipline them, Xiao went on the offense, giving Anne and the three fairies a chance to escape. Xiao could go all out now, and even though Rafal was cocky, he was constantly getting pushed back. But flying up to the ceiling, Rafal ripped apart the staircase Xiao stood on. With Xiao dust covered hanging on a ledge, Rafal laughed at him calling him pathetic, but telling him to follow outside. Immediately, a cold gale caught Xiao somewhat off guard. They were prepared to continue their duel until the sound of a horse neighing caught Rafal's attention. Outside was the Earl of Downing and the kingdom's troops charging towards the fortress. Rafal was taken aback, unable to comprehend how they found him, until he realized it was Xiao. He questioned if he was being betrayed by his allies once again, and hurt especially being betrayed by Xiao. Xiao, and I'm pretty sure everyone else never saw it that way though. With Rafal holding his wing, he was simply just another man who controlled him. They were never allies, and thus, no betraying or being betrayed. A year ago, 15-year-old Anne figured that out, but Rafal failed to understand. Rafal then asked if they had met before Xiao had met Anne, would he still have turned his sword towards him? To which Xiao responded, probably not, but this is destiny. Xiao readied his blade. However, Rafal decided to fall as tears welled in his eyes. Xiao rushed to look down, but Rafal was nowhere to be seen. With Anne and the fairies rushing to the entrance, they drew their blades at the sight of the humans. Anne begged them to stop because there was no way they could defeat the Earl's sheer numbers. And Xiao confirmed as well, telling all of them not to treat their lives like they were worthless. Anne then rushed to his side, relieved to see he survived, and cried in his arms. Lucelle then asked where Rafal was, and hearing he had jumped to his end, she felt sorry for him. All the fairies here did. Xiao then presented all of their wings that were inside of a chest, and told them once they retrieved theirs, to flee through the back gate. With the loss of their king, Lucelle asked Xiao to become their new one. He simply told them they didn't need a king to be free, and they should decide their futures for themselves. Lucelle stared, holding her wing, only realizing now how beautiful it truly was. She's decided to go with this orange-haired fairy so that they could both go see the ocean together. After they left, Anne wondered if Lucelle might be able to see the ocean. Xiao knew the lives of plant fairies were only a year long, but since she ate some of Anne's confections, 
He was sure she'd live at least long enough to see the water. He then grabbed onto Anne's hand and held it with their hopes together. Making it back to Hollyleaf Castle, Mithril was excited to see Anne and Shao were back, and so was everyone else. Kat and Jonas told them not to make a big deal of it, however, believing without a doubt she would have come back. Although, she was surprised to see Keith here. Inside the workshop, Anne marveled over the finished pieces. They handled everything with still 10 days left till the festival. Anne ran in, immersed by the glimmering lights of the snow towers. But with them being done early, she felt like they could add something more. Later that night, as Anne stared at the moon, Bridget returned the scarf Anne gave her the last time. Bridget then revealed she had dissolved her engagement to Elliot because of something Anne had once said to her. What is it that I can do in my current circumstances? While Anne was gone, Bridget tended to Orlin, then looked after everyone else. Doing that, she realized she truly loved the workshop and everyone in it. Elliot was a brilliant artisan. That's why when her father proposed their engagement, she thought nothing of it. But she never accepted it because she loved him. She realized she was suffocating. So, she instead suggested her father adopt Elliot and make him master of the workshop. Elliot had responded, I've been put through all sorts of trouble because of Bridget's demands. But this time, I think her demands make perfect sense. And the two girls laughed over this because it sounded exactly like what he'd say. At Lewiston Bell Church, the Page Workshop put together the final pieces of their commission. And after finishing, they all relaxed together with a nice meal for the night. Afterwards, everyone slept, but Anne still wanted to keep working. Adding the finishing touches, she looked up, staring at the ceiling art of the Fairy King battling King Cedric. Shao then came by to check on her. Sitting together, Anne still wondered about the talk of Rafal referring to himself and Shao being the will of the Fairy King. Knowing where he came from, Shao didn't know if he was the next Fairy King, and even if he did know for certain, he didn't believe becoming king would be easily achievable. There may come a time when it is necessary for him to take some kind of action, but that time isn't now. Right now, he planned to keep the vow he made to Anne and stay by her side forever. He wanted her to live a happy, human life, for her to do what she loves, go to places she loves, even find someone she loves so that they could have a great love together. For that, he'd be willing to protect her. Hearing him mention, find someone she loves, brought tears to Anne's eyes. Because she loved Xiao with all her heart, she thanked him, but then said if she ever ended up becoming perfectly happy, there'd be no need for his protection anymore. And if that happened, she'd want Xiao to have his turn to live as he wanted, for him to do the things he loved, go places he loved, find someone he loves and have a great love together. She wished for him to do that right now, but apologized, knowing the promise he's made to her was quite troublesome. He smiled at her, and told Anne to finish the last piece of the snow tower and bring good fortune to everyone in the kingdom as he held her hand. As Anne worked, she thought about how the Fairy King recognized King Cedric as a friend. The two kings searched for a path that humans and fairies could walk together. Their dream never came true, but the sugar confections that King Cedric had made for the late Reselva gained the power to summon great fortune. Her wish was for these snow towers to reach every single person in the kingdom so that it would also reach every single fairy as well. On the day of the festival, the lights lit the trees aglow, a scene truly beautiful as the church emanated a glowing snowy landscape. Master Glenn was in tears, seeing the fruition from the effort of his artisans. Outside, Hugh came by to congratulate Anne, knowing this would make the page workshop flourish again, but wondered if she'd be satisfied with just that. She hadn't really thought about anything past the Holy Beginnings Festival, but now contemplated what she wanted to do next as a Silver Sugar Master. Elliot advised her to expand her horizons, since working at the Page Workshop was a very small world. He didn't believe she should stay, but told her they'd welcome her back any time. Inside, everyone enjoyed the festival and it looks like Bridget and Orlin were getting pretty close. Kat teased Jonas a bunch, and Anne told Shao and Mithril she was leaving the Page Workshop. But when they questioned what she was gonna do, she got nervous, not having thought it through making Shao sigh, reminding Anne her brain was that of a scarecrow's. However, he smiled as he told her to do as she liked, because he'd follow her, no matter where she went. And so would Mithril, and the three enjoyed the festival under the glowing lights. What a beautiful end to this series. Subscribe to the channel for more. Also, watch this next video. It's me, Comfy T. I'll see you all in the next one.